Good morning, good morning. We're going to get started. Day three. Want to get started? So, with that, I'd like to call upon the drum for the opening song, and then we'll get right into the opening prayer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to call upon uh, Lucy Long Peter to come and open with prayer. Good morning. 
I check my sway. As to that work is to many Kishiga and Osmana. I come again as the quiest, uh, Ikis to Menosh and Meacham, Debeskagi, Meachiach. Um, it's a beautiful day out there today, for sure. And we really had a beautiful meal last night, Jimmy Quest. And uh, again, uh, my name is Lucy Longpeter. Um, I'm going to be switching back and forth Korean English uh, this morning. Um, I just want to tell you a little story how I received my spirit name. Uh, when I first started going to ceremonies many moons ago, um, I happened to go with a friend to uh, Manitoulin Island for a rain dance, which is similar to our sun dance, our Cree sun dances. And um, <clears throat> while I was there, um, we went to, I accompanied my friend as she went to see an elder because she was getting, uh, she was asking for her um, spirit name also and colors. So uh, when I walked in into the teepee with her, there was no man lying there, and he said to me, he, he pointed at me and he said, uh, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from originally from North, Northern Ontario. My family's from James Bay area. And he says, do you have a spirit name? I said, no. He says, well, go in the back over there. There's, the, uh, there's our medicine people are back there. They will give you a name. I said, okay. <laughs> so I went and um, I expected old people, like older people, but they were apprentices and they were young men and I was kind of shocked and I was kind of hesitant to go talk to them. But <clears throat> uh, I did and they were very, very, um, you could feel the, their, their uh, spiritual um, auras and they were uh, very friendly. So he just asked me a few questions and I answered them and then he kind of hesitated and just sitting there and, uh, and I'm just sitting there also wondering if I should say anything but and then he looked at me up at me he says um, he says I have a name for you and that's what it was but he said it in Ojibwe and uh, he said uh, I know you're not Ojibwe he said you can you try you translate that name into Cree so it's spring water woman so another question he asked me is is there anybody in your family that's Ojibwe and I kind of um, I wasn't really shocked but um, we always, uh, my family and I always said we were Cree because that's where my grandparents uh, uh, were from, at Wapiskat. But originally my late grandmother was from Ogoki. Uh, her family uh, traveled up the Albany uh, River many, many moons ago and uh, uh, lived in uh, Atwapiskat. And, and that's where they uh, resided. And, and uh, as my grandmother grew up, she caught the eye of one of the Cree men, I guess. <laughs> but anyways, that's, uh, so I just wanted to share that little story because I didn't share very much yesterday because I was so nervous. So, miigwech. Haog shemendo. Muska juna bego skon dishini khasan na meondo tem. To spend one Kishaman Donos Gagisha Gag Jimino Bunnik, a mamma had to go go Kamahanik, who is Giamitic, who is Nestaninan Kaya Piahut to Dostamach. Geometrical years would they have with the hog, Hoste? I come against the Kishaman don't despend him on Janagaja to the Achanus, Miss Sebogo, Miss Mitchinibogo Tashaneg, Tatu Kishigo, Munabogonos, Jamamo at the Ach, Nagachek, a Kishahok, Kashi, Kashi, Kashi Wiki, Nagachek, or Washashak, and you can ask the Mouch, Anus. Oshkiki Oshka to Sakati of a Czech Shemando Mitchenayaho Aho Mitchen Miss Wiggy one no Chego Ganush Shemando Jacomo Magam Mauch Ahusok 
Miigwech, miigwech to the drum for and the prayer for starting our day on a good in a good way. So before we start, I'm um, going to do a few housekeeping um, announcements. One is to make sure that the, um, the chiefs and delegates, if you can sign in, um, that helps us keep track of quorum, especially when we're going to get into resolutions this afternoon. And the other announcement we have is um, right across the hallway here, um, right across from where we're meeting, there's a celebration of life um, taking place there. So we need to be mindful of, um, I guess, talking outside the room. Um, it was announced to us by the hotel people. So my ink, agam, agam, agami. There's um, a celebration of life. We are going to go to the hotel. I didn't mind to go a little bit further to talk. But there's a celebration of life service taking place. So just to be mindful of that. Uh, just to make sure you sign in as well. That was the other one. And on each of your tables is the registration form for the upcoming NAPS, uh, NAN legal um, ch uh, chiefs meeting that's going to be taking place on September 12 to 14. It'd be good if you have that opportunity to sign up for that. That's happening in a few weeks. Any other announcements? Okay. So the other um, thing we'd like to um, bring up is that yesterday we didn't get to two items, three items on the agenda, so we just kind of um, move things around a little bit uh, to accommodate um, those, those items that we didn't get to. So we have a revised agenda. So quickly, I am going to go, um, just a quick recap of day two. I'm just going to do a quick recap. So day two began with a drum and opening prayer. Call to order was uh, done by myself. Uh, the Grand Chief uh, Acclamation Ceremony um, took place with Audrey Gibo, the head electoral officer, reviewing the NAN elections um, procedures. And um, the resolution uh, 2818 acclamation of NAN Grand Chief um, uh, was done with a mover and a seconder and a thirder. A thirder. And um, the elders, um, Helen Cromarty, Terry Fiddler, and Lucy Longpeter uh, led the uh, the ceremony related to that. And then there was an open there was an address by the um, Grand Chief um, Alvin Fiddler. And then the elders um, council um, did their presentation on and just some of the reminders that um, they wanted to bring to the delegation as elders to um, to Nan chiefs. And then there was a um, presentation by the Oshkat Tisset Council and the many uh, different um, uh, portfolios that they carry for the Oshkat Tisset um, people in our in our area. And there was also um, just recognition of the outgoing Oshkat Tisset Council members. And then the Nan Women's Council did their presentation and, and, and the good work that they're doing on behalf of the women in our in our area. And then the um, NAPS and OPP um, uh, Chief Roland Morrison did a presentation on the uh, call center and some of the changes that are going to be happening and how that's going to improve services for our people. 
And then there was a presentation um, by the Navajo um, people, and that was led by uh, Roland Morrison introducing them, and they did um, share some of the work that they're doing, the highlights of the work that they're doing in their region. And then we went into in-camera um, Wawate presentation. And uh, so we ended up having to move three of our items into today. So basically that is the recap. We, we did have the um, Kiwewin conference last night and it was very um, well attended and it was very um, very good to see how we honor our our members and the accomplishments they have. So with that, I'd like to call upon my co-chair, Adam Fiddler, and we'll get right into today's um, meeting. Miigwech. Miigwech, uh, Connie, thank you. So we'll uh, get right into the next uh, agenda item, uh, one of the items that was deferred from yesterday, and that's the nuclear waste uh, update. I'm going to call upon uh, Deputy Grand Chief uh, Ajni Beneskam. We'll also have uh, Jennifer Guerreri with uh, Anishinaabeaski Nation and Molly Churchill with uh, JFK Law, I believe, is joining us uh, virtually. As part of the presentation... Oh, she's here. Oh, there she is. She is here in person. Uh, as part of the presentation, uh, we will be going in camera. Now, that's just for part of the presentation. Uh, we'd like to present as much of the information here as well have it uh, uh, distributed online uh, so that people can observe and watch. It's very important that uh, everybody be aware of discussions. But there is a certain portion where we will be going in camera and uh, who we are asking uh, to leave will be any government officials, uh, of course media. Uh, we will be turning it offline. And any, uh, anybody that is uh, staff or associated with uh, the NWMO, that's the Nuclear Waste Management Ontario, just simply because it's important to have internal discussions. Uh, any non-citizens uh, can stay in the assembly room once we uh, go in camera. Uh, everybody else can stay. It's just those people that we will be asking to leave. Uh, for those very important discussions. But as part of the presentation, uh, it, will, it will be open and uh, the uh, online feed will still be open. So we'll, uh, we'll notify you when we're going in camera for that portion. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Deputy Grand Chief Anna Betty Ajani Beneskam to uh, introduce the topic. Miigwech, Adam. Miigwech. And, uh, and for the blessing of, of this day and, uh, and those things that sustain us, such as, uh, as the food that's, uh, that is provided to us. And also I want to acknowledge the, um, the prayers of, uh, in, in, the, in her words when she asked that we... Uh, you know, for the blessing of, of the leadership. Thank you for that, uh, Lucy. <clears throat> so part of, uh, as, uh, as Chair um, Adam Fiddler said, part of our um, presentation, uh, we will be going in camera. Um, but we felt it was very important um, <laughs> that we share a message with our citizens of Anishinaabeaski Nation uh, when it comes to, uh, um, you know, the proposed site of the, of the nuclear waste um, within the Ignis area. Since 1995, the NAN chiefs and assembly have, uh, we have resolutions dated from 1995 where, um, you know, there, it was very clear that we follow the mandate of, uh, of uh, opposing uh, a site within uh, our homelands are close to, uh, close to us. But there hasn't been any steps in, uh, taken in terms of how we're going to uh, 
proceed with uh, taking those steps. And um, so in order for us to do that, you know, we need to have research, uh, we need to have legal opinions, uh, we need to have uh, some capacity with getting um, uh, advice uh, in um, that collaboration, um, like with, uh, with uh, an Anand um, uh, ch uh, task team, like uh, made up of, uh, of chiefs and other um, technicians. And um, so afterwards, uh, we have a plan. And, um, and before we proceed with, uh, with uh, providing the information on the plan, um, um, Jennifer is going to uh, do a, a bit of a presentation. And then, um, and then we will be going into camera because that part uh, um, um, will be uh, talking about uh, the strategy. We feel it is very important that, uh, that we maintain transparency and accountability when it comes to um, providing information to our NAN citizens and also building partnerships with uh, the with, uh, Grand Council uh, Treaty 3 and, and the community of Wabagoon um, to, uh, I guess, to collaborate uh, in terms of, uh, because we don't know exactly what their position is and, and it's very important that we, uh, um, you know, have discussions with them. We have sent them letters, and at this time, we uh, haven't had a response yet. But our priority is uh, a communication process and collecting um, evidence for us to protect our, our homelands. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Jennifer now and, and to Molly as well, and I'm very thankful um, that, uh, that they have been helping uh, us with this uh, with this file. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Grand Chief. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Deputy's hard work on this file. Um, it was transferred to her um, after the uh, previous Grand Chief was removed from office, and and she's done um, an amazing job at really picking up the work and. Uh, moving the mandate forward that was given by the chiefs. Closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Guerreri. I'm the senior policy analyst at Anishinaabe Aski Nation in the Infrastructure and Housing Department. Um, I want to thank the chiefs, uh, the proxies, all the councils, and the NAN citizens for attending and listening to this important presentation. So I've held this file uh, since last year. Uh, you may have recalled that I did present at Kiwewin um, last August in Timmins. I'm just gonna go to my clicker here. So the goal of today's presentation is to provide an update as well as uh, look to uh, move forward a resolution that would support the terms of reference for the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee and that was mandated by the chiefs in the previous resolution last August. And we're also looking to the chiefs for some guidance and direction on how to support implementation of the work plan we've developed. Um, so some background, we'll cover um, sort of a high level overview on the NWMO proposal and the process, as well as previous NAN resolutions related to nuclear waste. So those were handed out to you in a package, as well as the draft resolution that we're looking to move today on the floor. Uh, we'll also discuss um, implementation of our action plan, um, some of the work that the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee will be doing, and the need to obtain resources to complete this important work. Um, so at the end of the presentation, we will, um, like Deputy and, and the Chair mentioned, go into camera and allow some discussion on the floor amongst the leadership. So the NWMO is the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Um, they were established under legislation from the federal government 
and their job is to propose a nuclear waste fuel approach as well as select a site where that deep geological repository can be located. So currently there's still two sites uh, on the table. One is near Revel Lake, just past Ignace, Ontario, and the other is in South Bruce in southern Ontario, quite a bit closer obviously to the reactor sites where the waste is currently stored. Um, so a deep geological repository has been chosen as the preferred method to store nuclear waste. And the NWMO has said they will be selecting a site for the repository by the fall of 2024. Um, once that site is selected, they will bring that site to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and they will assess that selected site and that's when federal and provincial crown processes will begin. So after the site is selected. Uh, you'll see here it's a diagram of what the facility is intended to look like. So it's, it's a pretty large area um, underground. On the surface there will be a repackaging plant where the waste will be transferred from the shipping containers into the storage containers. Um, and then there's also um, room to expand that facility in the future as well. So just an overview of the NWMO site selection process. So this is a breakdown of the steps. Um, currently right now we're at step three. So where they're trying to make a decision between the two sites. Um, then they'll move into, like I mentioned, regulatory processes where they will look at, um, you know, evaluating that site, uh, move into environmental assessment processes and eventually construction. So just to, to review this again, um, currently we're in a pre-regulatory process. So the site selection um, right now is being managed by the NWMO. There is no Crown consultation process yet. Um, and the NWMO has been tasked with this, um, this duty, I guess, to choose a, a preferred site where there's a willing host. So once the project is complete, um, the NWMO will submit the proposed site, like I said, to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and then those processes will commence. Um, the regulatory processes, um, once they begin, an application will be submitted by the NWMO on the preferred site, and that's when um, the Government of Ontario and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission will um, look at impact assessments, and they will begin consultation processes. So they do uh, hope to obtain approval, um, like I said, on that site by next year, um, selecting it and bringing it forward, and then starting construction, they aim by 2033 and 2040 by the start of operations, where they would begin to move the waste from the reactor sites to the repository. Um, so the resolutions package that was handed out to you covers the previous resolutions. They're listed here, uh, the most recent one being last August, um, which directed us to uh, form the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee. And uh, we wanted to, you to have the resolution so you could see, you know, the long history, I think, of, you know, the NAND chiefs really opposing nuclear waste in our territory. I think it's also important to note that um, previous to these resolutions, in, in 1990, there were federal panel hearings on the social acceptability of a, the concept of a deep geological repository. Um, and at the time, uh, NAN Deputy Grand Chief Charles Fox did bring forward a presentation to that panel as well as a written submission, um, stating very clearly that NAN opposed nuclear waste in its territory and that if they shall come to a site selection process, um, that they will need our consent. So this is just a quick um, overview of the section of the resolution from last year that speaks to the mandating of the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee, which is the terms of reference that we've brought in front of you today. So we've established the committee. Um, it was mandated by resolution. Um, the draft terms of reference have been circulated to you for review. Um, we would like the support of the Chiefs to move forward with those terms of reference so that the committee can begin this very important work. 
And I think the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee is, is key um, in this entire process because they're comprised of, you know, chiefs, um, experts, knowledge keepers, elders, and really looking at, you know, contributing to NAN's efforts when it comes to advocacy and negotiation on this file, but as well bringing together information. So existing traditional land use studies, um, you know, knowledge that they hold about use of the land and, and your way of life and working with the experts, which will be independent, that we will bring in, and compiling all of this information in order to bring it to the communities and discuss the risks of the project. Um, they've provided a lot of support and advice to us so far. Um, we've already held a couple meetings, and, and uh, it's been extremely valuable to the work. Um, so, more specifically, the purpose of the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee um, is, you know, to become informed about the project, um, to assist us in relaying the risks to the NWMO, um, providing their advice, um, you know, bringing together experts that they're aware of from the communities, compiling that traditional knowledge, um, and really identifying any other relevant considerations um, as we move forward in this work. And they're also assisting us with developing a community engagement plan. So once we've gathered all of this information, we would like to bring it to the communities and uh, they'll be assisting us with that as well. Uh, so we've listed the current members of the committee. Uh, we've had three meetings to date. Um, we've discussed obviously the terms of reference, um, our strategy when it comes to this file and um, the potential to obtain funding uh, in order to undertake this work. So the CTAC work plan um, in a little more detail is intended to work with the elders of the communities um, to conduct an independent study and bring forward credible risk to the NWMO. So risk that we can support by information that's already been gathered through existing studies, knowledge, um, you know, through our elders and our community members, and really look at the impacts on traditional land use. Um, we've sought out independent experts, um, so separate from the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, to look at the risks of nuclear waste. Um, I think that that's a big piece of this, is to educate our communities on the facts of the nuclear waste, of the facilities themselves, and the details of the project. So we'll be looking at NWMO's proposal. Um, we'll also be looking at, within that, the transportation and emergency response um, planning and, and risks associated with that. Um, if they were to choose the IGNACE site, the waste will have to be moved uh, a great distance in order to get to the repository. And we also want to take a look at the risks to um, our watersheds. So uh, we mentioned that in last, uh, last year's presentation where the proposed site for the repository is located, um, the water from that site does flow you know, west and north uh, into NAN territory. Um, so it's important in this work to have direct engagement with the NWMO. Um, it's important for them to understand the risks to NAN territory and, and to your way of life. And we want to have that process where we can bring forward those risks to them and um, bring forward the expert advice that we receive as well. Uh, so here's just a little uh, infographic to explain, um, I think, the relationship and the goals of NAN and CTAC um, supporting each other in moving this file forward. So the independent experts, like I said, will assess the NWMO project information, work with our knowledge keepers and elders, and help raise the concerns to the NWMO. Um, the community engagement, we hope to receive concerns back from community members, um, share information on the project and these independent studies, and be able to bring those concerns forward to the NWMO. Um, so, like I mentioned before, it's very important for us to seek independent advice from the NWMO. So, a nuclear scientist that can review um, the plan that they're proposing and really, you know, the safety and the potential risks of a plan like this. Um, the transportation and emergency response, like I said, is another key piece of this. Um, one site 
as I mentioned, is quite close to the reactors and, and the Rebel Lake site near Ignace is a fair distance away, so there's significant risk when it comes to the transportation that needs to be assessed. Um, keeping in mind with um, compiling existing land use studies, um, we will be respecting OCAP principles um, and, like I said, working with our elders and our knowledge keepers. And I'm going to, at this point, turn it over to Molly Churchill. Um, she's with JFK Law, and we have obtained them for legal support on the file. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I wish I had maybe reverse heels, but if I, if I get too far away from the mic, please don't be shy to let me know. I want to make sure that I can be heard clearly. Um, it's an honor to be here before you, chiefs and proxies. Um, I'd like to thank also Lucy Longpeter for opening up today um, and recognize the drum and the ceremonial items as well. As, so my name's Molly Churchill. I'm a lawyer at JFK Law, and I'm part of the team there that's supporting Nan on this file working alongside a partner Jeff Langlois and partner Sarah Mainville. I know Jeff is um, joining virtually today. I'm not sure with the schedule change whether Sarah was able to. And that, okay, wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and another colleague, May Price, um, has also been working on this file. So as Jen has helped explain sort of where we're at now, the Chiefs and Assembly have very, very clearly expressed opposition to there being nuclear waste stored so close to your territories and to having nuclear waste transported from southern Ontario to northwestern Ontario. Um, there's no definite route planned for how that transportation would happen. It would either be by trucks or by train um, and so it would, if it's not going through your territory, it would at least be going near it. And that would be, you know, for decades that that, that waste would continue to be um, transported. So you were very clear in your opposition. That opposition has been brought to the NWMO. And it's, sort, it's, it's time now to, to fill that in and make sure um, that you, that NAN has the technical expertise and the resources it needs to provide, um, to compile evidence that the NWMO will take notice of. So right now the NWMO has sort of said, we hear that you're saying no, but you're not providing us with any evidence that's kind of making us um, take that very seriously, essentially. Um, and so in order to be you know, raising that credible risk and explaining your position in a way that they understand. There are kind of three things that you need, right? You need money, time, and people. So right now we have, you have people in place. There's the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee has been formed. There are independent experts. That means people with no association to the NWMO who are, you know, ready to be engaged to be providing that independent advice and independent assessment to you so that you don't have to be relying on the information provided by the NWMO and can be confident that you're getting that in independent assessment that you need. Um, so you have people. Time is short. Um, the NWMO says it wants to be making a selection on a proposed site within a year. So that doesn't give a lot of time to be raising those risks to influence and impact the decision that the NWMO is going to make. And money right now you don't have. So to date, the work that NAN has been doing on this file has come from NAN's own budget without any dedicated outside source of funding. Um, and in order to get that technical advice that you need in order to ensure that information exchange with community members, um, to be working with elders, to be working with knowledge keepers. Y you need that money. It's, it's a costly um, undertaking. Uh, so there is, so Jen explained, we're, 
in a kind of unique pre-regulatory phase. No crown process has been triggered at this point. That won't happen until a site is selected and the NWMO goes to the crown and says, this is the site that we want to build this project at, and that would trigger the regulatory processes. So right now, the only kind of dedicated funding um, stream that is through the NWMO. The NWMO has indicated an openness to funding some of the work that NAN wants to do. And um, it was important for NAN to be bringing this forward to you as chiefs in assembly because the as Deputy Grand Chief spoke of, that need for transparency and informed decisions. We're aware that um, elsewhere in the province there has been some controversy when it comes to agreements to receive funding from the NWMO. So we wanted to bring this forward to the chiefs and explain um, sort of some of the differences between some agreements that you may have heard about and any agreement that NAN would consider entering into and to get your guidance on this, um, sort of um, determine whether it's to move forward with this. So the, uh, probably many of you are aware that there was a, a previous, um, an agreement signed elsewhere in the province that with NWMO that was supposed to be confidential, but became leaked. And the, that agreement um, was pretty, there were many elements to it, and it included contemplating the negotiation of planning and regulatory matters in the event that the Ignis site was chosen. So it was um, going into that step of saying, if we're in the place where Ignis is chosen, let's start looking at planning and regulatory matters. That is not what NAN um, is, is doing. This is not where NAN is. NAN has a mandate from you saying, we don't want this site. And so any agreement NAN would consider would be circumscribed and focused specifically on um, providing NAN and the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee with the capacity and resources needed to raise concerns about the propo proposed IGNIS site and the transportation plan. So it would focus on building capacity to oppose that site. It would not focus on what's going to happen if, if and when that site is chosen. Um, another thing is that the leaked agreement was, had strict confidentiality provisions, and that is not something that NAN would agree to, given the need for transparency on this really important matter, right? Um, so that, that, that sort of strict confidentiality provision is not something that, that NAN would entertain. Um, another really important thing is that any agreement NAN might consider would be without prejudice to NAN's ability to continue to oppose the, a DGR, a deep geological repository at IGNIS, um, and making it clear that this, you know, this is definitely not a discharging of consultation obligations just by accepting the funding needed to get that technical advice and to make sure that that information flow is happening um, from the grassroots level at NAN as well. Um, so I think we're at the point where we'll be moving into the in-camera discussion, just given the potential for, for strategic and legal questions and issues to arise. Um, just before we do that, sort of these next steps here are one, as, as Jen explained previously, um, looking for a resolution supporting the terms of reference for the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee so that it is solid moving forward. Um, and then the second is the direction on securing funding to enable that uh, committee to undertake the work plan um, that it set out for itself. So with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Coming back, right? Okay. 
Thank you, uh, Molly Churchill. So at this point, uh, we are going in camera, and I just want to explain uh, the in-camera uh, portion. Uh, any non-citizens, if you are here, uh, you don't have to worry. Uh, you can stay in the room. Uh, the purpose of going in camera is to exclude uh, any government officials, uh, media, and anybody associated with uh, NWMO, that's the Nuclear Waste Management Ontario. So, uh, unfortunately, even if you are a NAN member, if you are a member of the media, uh, government, or associated or work with the NWMO, uh, you're going to be asked to uh, vacate the room. So, we will be going in camera, we will also be going offline, uh, otherwise everybody else can remain. Uh, let me know. Okay, we're back on. So welcome to those uh, joining on the live feed. We are back. Uh, we've concluded the in-camera session. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Youth Co-Chair Kyra to go right into the next uh, agenda item. So miigwech for the presentation. Thank you, Adam. Um, good morning, guys. Uh, so next on the agenda, we're going to go to remoteness Quotient, National Assembly of Remote Communities Update. And this is going to be done by Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse and Vice Chief David Pratt from Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. Miigwech. Good morning, good afternoon. Oh, yeah, it is morning, right? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Uh, Deputy Grand Chief Bobby Narcisse, and uh, here to uh, uh, give some information and update on uh, some very crucial work uh, that we've been doing with respect to uh, our remoteness and our remoteness quotient uh, work. And I do have a special guest with me as well from uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, he's going to be joining us uh, very shortly. Uh, but uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, give you a brief overview on RQ. What is RQ, our remoteness quotient work, what's been happening there? So uh, just a little bit of uh, brief background. I know we're a little bit behind schedule. But uh, at the uh, Chief's Assembly in January 2023, Chiefs directed the executive to provide an update on NAN's remoteness quotient work, that's RQ. Uh, what it is and what is the results. And so uh, here we are. We're going to give you an update on what RQ is, uh, what's happening uh, with that particular area. Yeah, so in, uh, in 2007, the Caring Society and Assembly First Nations start the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case about First Nations children and family services program and Jordan's principal. On January 2016, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal finds discrimination uh, and remoteness is a key factor within that, uh, that ruling from uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. Uh, so in 2016, uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation uh, through uh, Chief's resolution, sought intervener status at the Canadian, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal uh, to, to bring that remote community's perspective. As you know, uh, each of our communities in Anishinaabe Aski Nation have a, various degrees of remoteness, whether if you're fly-in, uh, what if your road access, it's always access to essential services and the lack of uh, those essential services or infrastructure uh, that uh, poses a barrier to, to, to having those services for our children. Uh, so uh, we're granted uh, status at the uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. In 2017, CHRT, the Tribunal, orders Canada to partner with Nishnabi Aski Nation to develop a remoteness quotient methodology through NAN uh, Canada through development of Anishinaabe Aski Nation uh, RQ table. So we set this table up. So uh, 
We at uh, Anishinaabe Aska Nation, through our Chiefs Committee on Children, Youth and Families, uh, hired experts uh, to research to account for increased costs due to remoteness. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to teach you on that because you come from our communities and you go to your northern stores or you go to your, uh, your, your stores uh, wherever you may be or you have to drive to the next town and you don't understand the prices that our families and your citizens face uh, when they're trying to just get even food security measures and, and going in head with that. The cost of fuel, the cost of gas, cost of hydro, all these particular areas. And uh, whereas like our programs are, and services are still funded at a fixed level, uh, same as a community down south, and they don't really account uh, for that increased cost. And that, hence, that's why we are unique. And that's why uh, many of our children, youth, and families are still uh, suffering as a result of those lack of uh, infrastructure, capital investments, and, and services. And that's what we want to really look at when we were uh, hiring our experts to look at, okay, well, what does it cost? You know, like if the only, if the only language the crown or levels of government know is money and economics, well, let's show them. Let's show them how much it really costs. Let's bring them up to our communities. Let's give the Minister of uh, Children, uh, uh, Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services uh, an OW check and say, okay, well, go buy some groceries up northern. Let's see how far uh, that will take you. Or let's see how much vegetables or, or good food uh, you can afford uh, with, uh, with that check, you know. And that also produces all these other underlying health costs, like, you know, there's the rising cost of diabetes and uh, all those particular areas where our families, you know, sad to say, they, they can't really afford uh, those particular areas. So we did some research on those particular areas. Uh, so Anishinaabe Aski Nation in 2019 files a report. Uh, we did a report on the RQ Phase 2 with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. So uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation's uh, remoteness work has led to funding increases. Uh, we've been at this work for a few years now. So uh, we have uh, been able to secure additional uh, resources in particular areas and services for child and family services, uh, for prevention funding, for the Choose Life, uh, for the band rep uh, uh, programs uh, that are there. And like I said, many of these in initiatives uh, uh, were made possible through the uh, NAN uh, Canada RQ table. And uh, so these are particular areas that we just also want to quickly uh, uh, share with you. Uh, we want to hear uh, what the, re uh, the remoteness quotient is directly, uh, how it affected uh, our NAN communities. And I'd like to in uh, introduce uh, Dr. Martin Cook. Uh, from the University of Waterloo, and uh, Dr. David Stiff. Uh, he's uh, joining us uh, online, and uh, we, uh, he, they're from the uh, Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis. So this is just basically like, like a real economics, empirical exercise where, you know, we're speaking a language where, uh, you know, uh, funders and government are coming from. This is the actual cost. This is what it costs to deliver those programs and services within our communities. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Martin Cook uh, come, to come up and share some of his uh, research and methodology on how uh, we come to, to do this very, very important work. So. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Grand Chief. Uh, first, thank you very much to the drum and to the elder for the opening. Um, thank you, Chiefs and Assembly, uh, for having us here. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Grand Chiefs. Thank you, Grand Chief, for making time on your, on your agenda. So my colleague and I, uh, David Stiff, uh, have been working for some time on behalf of NAN on the issue of adjusting the costs of funding to account for remoteness. Um, and presently, we're part of a technical table uh, working technicians table working with Canada to try to identify the, a way to to do this or to recommend a way to do this so my job uh, David will present a more detailed update about our activities and where we're at with regard to that table 
Uh, my job is to set the stage and describe the sorts of issues that we face when we want to adjust for remoteness because it's not, it's not as clear as, as, well, it's certainly not as clear as it was when I started doing this. So um, thanks very much for your time. So the first thing, I, I think it's important for us to be clear about what it is we're trying to adjust for. Um, there's many ways in which service delivery is affected by remoteness. Uh, one, as Deputy Grand Chief uh, Narcisse said, um, it's the cost associated with remoteness. Everything costs more and those are passed through to service providers. But there's other ways. So for instance, not all services are available in remote communities. We know this with regard to almost every sphere, education, social and services and so on. So that's an aspect of remoteness. Also, it might be that there's more need for services. So when we're thinking about children and youth services as we are, in this case, child and family services, there might be more need in remote communities for various reasons. So those, that's also important. But for us, we're focused specifically on the additional cost for services. And we think of it this way. Basically, a dollar spent to provide services or a dollar of funding to provide services in Toronto does not go as far as you know very well in a remote community. And so in a sense, being remote, remoteness is a tax on the funding, an additional cost that's there. And so our job is to try to identify how much that additional tax is and then how it has to be compensated for in funding. So that's the narrow, our narrow mandate those other things, availability of services and additional need are important, but they're not what we're focused on specifically. So to answer our question of, or of how that funding should be adjusted, really there's three issues here. Um, and so I just want to briefly touch on the three of them, how we measure remoteness, the relationship between remoteness and funding, and then the indexation. Um, just to give you a sense of the issues that we're dealing with our, at our table. So the, the first is defining and measuring remoteness. There's no universal way of defining who is and who isn't remote. And I think we all have a sense of what, you know you're, if your community is remote, but how do we define that? Usually we refer to something like distance or the cost of travel to a community um, as part of remoteness, how we define remoteness. But that, even that isn't very clear. Like distance to what? Distance to the closest city or distance to a city that has specific services that you need. So it, even that isn't totally clear. There's also the question of whether we think of remoteness as being something that's discrete or continuous. And so by discrete, I mean, are some communities remote and some communities aren't remote? And that's it. So maybe some communities are remote, some communities are very remote, some communities are not remote at all. Or is it continuous? Does every community have some degree of remoteness somehow? And we need to adjust for that. So these are some of the things that we need to think about when we're defining and measuring remoteness. And here's an example. You're all, everybody here I'm sure is familiar with the, the band classification manual from INAC that is used, I think, I understand it's still used for some programs. And so, as you probably know, it divides communities into four zones based on how far a community is to a service center. In this case, a service center is just a community that has uh, government services, banks and suppliers and so on. Uh, it considers whether there's year-round road access and considers whether uh, also the latitude, how far north you are. And so it comes up with four zones and puts all communities into four zones. Well, I think everybody who's experienced it knows there's problems with this, right? One of which is, okay, so you're 300 you're, you're, one community is 350 kilometers away, the other one's 355 kilometers away, and that puts you into a different zone. But are the costs really any different based on those five kilometers? Plus, there's other things to consider, right? Not every com communities are all different in various ways. Um, another issue to think about is, uh, well, I guess, the, yeah, is how, how those things are adjudicated, right? So there's so much diversity within one of these zones. How do we deal with um, the diversity of communities that are, we're all within zone three or all within zone four? 
Another, a different way of doing that, and so a more recent approach is, is what we call gravity models, and I won't be too technical about this, but if we consider the gravity how, if we consider the planet Earth, for instance, and how the planet Earth, we're affected by the gravity of the sun, which is huge, and we're affected by the gravity of the moon, which is smaller but closer. In the same way, communities are, are, are connected to other communities of different sizes. We're not just connected to one community. It doesn't just matter how far you are from Timmins. It also matters how far you are from Toronto. And so gravity models consider all of these different communities. And, so, and they consider the travel costs to all of these communities and come up with a continuous number. So the least remote communities, basically Toronto, get a zero, and then the most remote communities get a one, and every community has a number based on, on that. So that's a different way of approaching the measurement. So just to say this measurement of remoteness is not technically easy. And then the second thing we have to deal with at our table is how to connect remoteness to costs. So even if we have a way of defining whether, remote, whether communities are remote or are not remote, then how do we estimate how that remoteness is affected by costs? And basically, we know that there's so many ways in which service provision is affected by remoteness. So obviously, as Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse pointed out, costs for materials, costs for food, costs for good, costs for salaries and benefits, paying a social worker is different, costs for just energy, the additional wear and tear on infrastructure, all of these things are very complicated and they all affect service delivery in different ways. So how do we understand how remoteness affects those costs? There's two ways. One is we can directly measure it and the other one is we can statistically model it. So the direct measurement approach means doing something like what Stats Canada does when they collect data for the consumer price index to measure inflation. In that case, they take a list of 700 goods and services, go into every community, and find out how much they cost in that case. That's the most direct way of measuring it. It's complicated and expensive. Right now, the Consumer Price Index is not connect collected in First Nations, as we, we know. Um, and if we wanted to do it for child and family services or for other services, the question is, what is that mix of things we need to know the costs for? because it's complicated, because a service agency needs a lot of things, and the, way, the weight of those things is different than what families need in their own shopping baskets. And the other way we do it is through statistical modeling of different ways. And so that takes less data. We take some examples from some example communities, and maybe we don't collect data on every single good and service that they need, but we do on some, and we try to select some that will let us estimate what the cost is for remote communities. So that's another approach. So that's one of the things that we're working on, which is better in, uh, for doing this. And then the third issue that we're trying to deal with at our table is the issue of how we index costs for remoteness. How we act, once we measure remoteness, we measure costs and we relate the two so we know how much more a remote community is paying, then we need to find a way to, to adjust funding based on those costs. And there's even more questions here. So for one thing, if we're adjusting funding base for costs, do we do it specifically for child and family services? Or do we use the same approach that could be used for things like education, social services, health? Or does it have to be specific to a specific service category? Uh, secondly, do all communities get some adjustment for being remote? As I said, all communities potentially have some degree of remoteness. Or is it only communities with a certain level of remoteness and higher that get adjusted for remoteness? Uh, third, is the adjustment based on just an increment? So as we say, a tax, basically every dollar of funding in a remote community needs to have an additional amount added to it in order to account for remoteness. Is it just an increment or does it come from a fixed pot that needs to be divided amongst communities? That's another important question. And lastly, when we come up with a plan for how we do this, this adjustment for remoteness, how do we do deal with changes? Because we know that roads get built, uh, ferries get scheduled or uh, are broken, um, airlines give services, don't give services, things change. And so how do we deal with the fact that these remoteness might change, degree of remoteness can change, also costs change, so how, so how do we do that? 
So that's the work that we've been doing on behalf of, of NAN and uh, in collaboration also uh, at the table with Canada in order to try to come up uh, with an understanding of how this is best done. I'd just like to say what we've heard when we've talked to community members in particular about this sort of work is, is we've heard that, well, you're, you know, you're coming up with some number that does this, this adjustment and it doesn't really reflect the way that, you know, it doesn't in include everything. And just to say, of course, we know that coming up with a, a number adjustment doesn't uh, deal with everything. And so we can't come up with a, a, a way of doing that, of dealing with all of the complexity of remoteness. But what we can do is come up with a good estimate of that tax, of how much more it costs to deliver a service uh, in a remote uh, area. And so that's what we're working on. So thank you very much for having us. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cook. Also, we have uh, another member of our uh, team. Uh, we have uh, David Stiff. He's online. So uh, David, uh, can, you, uh, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So uh, you got yeah, you got the great. floor. All right, great. And uh, I have the presentation. How is that? Uh, is that queued up there? Or do I share it myself? Uh, here oh, we go. Per yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so as Marty said, thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to actually talk about the work we're doing and share. It's always great to uh, let people know all of the great technical work that's happening on this uh, RQ technical table. And I'm just going to take uh, everyone through a little bit of the results that have come out of the first uh, RQ uh, round of work, uh, which was submitted to the CHRT uh, in 2019, and then the ongoing work that we're doing in terms of improving the remoteness quotient and uh, ongoing research uh, at the RQ technical table. So the next slide, or how does that work? All right, thank you. Um, so it, again, I just want to emphasize a little bit in terms of, uh, reemphasize a little bit of what Marty had mentioned, is that the objective of the RQ research was really to understand on a unit cost basis how costs should be adjusted. Um, the objective wasn't to come up with a whole new funding formula for uh, child and family services, but to really understand how this uh, remoteness tax should be calculated, how big that should be uh, in order to be able to appropriately account for that uh, in any uh, any other funding model that was developed. Uh, the result of this research uh, was, uh, for the first round was uh, completed uh, in 2018. It was developed uh, with a uh, collaboration uh, with some other uh, researchers who are actually on the ground and visited many of uh, your communities to understand the, si the actual situation on, uh, that all the community members face. And that uh, was developed uh, in 2018 and submitted, as I mentioned, in 2019. The full re report, including all of the technical details, is available on NAN's website. Uh, I'm going to avoid the technical aspects and really just talk about the, the general uh, approach and results and the ongoing research that we're doing uh, uh, today. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so just a brief background, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, in Ontario, uh, child and family services were delivered by 50 agencies across the, the province. Most of them cover distinct geographic areas, so some of them overlap. And there are three agencies uh, that provide uh, services to 49 of the NAN communities in Northern Ontario that we focused on uh, in the analysis. Okay. Next, there you go. Uh, we wanted to get a good understanding and incorporate into the analysis the wide portfolio of services that these agencies provide, uh, both at the larger agency level and through the communities. Uh, and so we, we did try to ca uh, include all the, many of the different aspects from uh, pre admission prevention down to boarding and customary care, uh, the whole group that we've included uh, in the analysis. So it is, uh, the, the RQ work was focused very much towards the, the uh, CFS services in Ontario, uh, with uh, trying to tune it specifically to those uh, services that were, were needed uh, by looking at how it compares to other parts of the province. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, so we actually had access to a, quite a bit of data uh, from across the province, both from the, the 
uh, three NAN agencies and also uh, the rest other parts of the province all the way down to uh, Toronto and non-remote areas. And we were able to look at the differences in expenditures uh, that could arise from a variety of different factors, one of those being remoteness, uh, but costs across different agencies also vary due to population size, the number of children, uh, quite a few other factors. And what we were really after was trying to develop a statistical model that isolates the unit costs of remote, due to remoteness relative to non-remote agencies. And this is really a minimum estimate of the cost required to bring uh, funding of these more remote agencies up to a level equal, so they're able to provide the same level of service uh, to uh, non-remote agencies. Okay, next slide. Uh, so there's really a few key questions that had to be answered when we were developing the uh, remoteness quotient work. The first was, well, how do we actually quantify geographic remoteness? Uh, as Marty mentioned uh, a few moments ago, there's quite a few varieties and approaches that, be, that could be adopted, uh, whether it's discrete categories or what we chose is Statistics Canada Remoteness Index. It's a continuous measure. Uh, for all communities and, and First Nations in Ontario and Canada-wide, actually, uh, that provides that relative measure of remoteness uh, on a continuous scale ranging from zero to one uh, for, for all communities across the country. From the expenses and cost side of things, uh, we're actually able to get uh, considerable data from Ontario Children's Aid Society expenditures. Uh, that we're able to use uh, in the analysis to uh, get information on all the salaries, all the different services uh, that, that were provided. Uh, and that was important partly because it provides consistent definitions for remote and non-remote agencies uh, for all agencies across the year, uh, sorry, across the province and over uh, several years as well. Uh, and we are, uh, in terms of things like the sizes of the communities, uh, we were using Statistics Canada data for that at the moment. So, all right, next slide. Uh, so just going to jump right to the results. Uh, basically, there's quite a bit of regression and math and analysis in the background that, as I mentioned, you can find in the reports. Uh, but basically, what it came down to, to show was that uh, the additional cost due to remoteness for the three NAN agencies in particular uh, ranged up to almost 70% uh, additional was needed for Tikhanagan uh, and almost 50% for uh, Kunawanamino uh, as well. So all of these uh, results reflected the, and showed the real shortfall of, of funding and additional cost due to remoteness uh, that these agencies faced. Uh, one of the interesting things that did come out of the analysis is that many of the other more remote uh, areas as well uh, also had similar issues uh, in terms of cost, but much smaller scale than uh, the NAN communities. All right, the next slide, please. So that was the result of the first uh, phase of the RQ work. Uh, it's still ongoing at the moment, and we're looking to try and improve the criteria uh, and approach to calculating the, the remoteness uh, quotient uh, factors. So recently, um, the RQ table has identified additional criteria that any uh, acceptable uh, remoteness quotient approach should adopt or should satisfy. Um, there should be an objective measurement of remoteness. Any analysis should be technically acceptable. Uh, one of the key things is any of the data that goes into the analysis, ideally if it's accessible uh, as well so that other people can actually view the calculations, reproduce the, ca the results to understand exactly where these numbers are, are coming from. Uh, as uh, the funding of child and family services across First Nation evolves. We want to have something that's applicable to both agencies and uh, communities, uh, because there's a lot of work being done at the community level uh, around these issues as well. Ideally, one of the criteria we also like it to satisfy is that the remoteness quotient should be generalizable across both geographic and uh, sectoral areas. So that means while the research was being done for Ontario, uh, being able to apply it across the rest of the province, uh, or sorry, the rest of the country, uh, would be a nice uh, capability of it uh, as well. 
And across different sectors, for example, if the framework that we develop is not only applicable to child and family services, but also uh, education or, or, or policing or healthcare, uh, all of those, if all of those can be applied as well, then again, that adds some more uh, power and utility to the, the work that we're doing. And whatever we come up with as well, there should be some means to actually validate that uh, the what we're calculating is actually achieving the outcomes that we want in terms of uh, providing this additional funding and, and outcomes for uh, First Nations. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so as uh, Marty mentioned, uh, all this RQ table work is being done in partnership with Canada. Uh, they, uh, both everyone is working collaboratively at the RQ table, and ISC has actually developed a, a different index, uh, an adjustment factor uh, that's applicable across Canada. It's called the cost adjustment factor. Uh, it has the advantage that it uses national data. Uh, it's readily available uh, for any community. The real disadvantage is it's not specific to CFS or any other uh, sector. Uh, the remoteness quotient work that was done in the first phase was Ontario focused and designed for CFS, uh, which is great if you're interested in that, uh, but it wasn't real. It had a bit of an Ontario focus and comparable national data wasn't uh, readily available. So we can almost view these two different measures or two different approaches as two points on the same broader uh, continuum or framework. And the ongoing RQ work that's uh, going on at the moment is to try and combine the advantages of both these two approaches uh, in a manner that adheres to the framework criteria that, that we've established. And this is ongoing work uh, that's expected to be uh, wrapped up uh, later this year uh, in terms of some first results of the RQAF. At the next slide, please. And so as probably uh, notice this, it's a, the RQ tech table is fairly active in terms, or quite active in terms of ongoing research and program uh, and projects. Um, it both consists of representatives from NAN and uh, Canada, and we're all collaborating on providing input on the research agenda and what we would like to be able to understand uh, better. Um, and so this includes, as I mentioned, improving uh, the existence existing methodology to combine the strengths of the RQ and the, the CAF, uh, resulting in the creatively named RQAF. Uh, and ideally, we'd like a framework that's applicable Canada-wide, possibly to other sectors. Uh, we're updating everything with the most recent data. Since we've done the first report, new census data has come out. There's new remoteness indexes have been updated. Uh, so incorporating all of that new information. And uh, collecting, uh, looking at how we can collect different costs and services uh, to incorporate into the model and hope to have some draft reports out uh, later this fall, early this fall. Uh, we also want to try and distribute more information via working papers, uh, for example, the framework criteria, uh, because we've done quite a bit of work uh, with everyone on, on the table and uh, doing a lot of research and, and thought about how to actually measure remoteness and quantify it, and want to be able to share that with different uh, everyone who's interested in that to be able to take advantage of the work that's being done on, on the table. And then finally, just one last slide, I think. I just to give a, a sample of some of the other projects that are going on on the RQ table, uh, one, uh, it's looking at how remoteness changes over time. Uh, the remoteness index was uh, published in 2016, but it's been re-update, it's been updated uh, with the newest census data, newest transport data, and there's been changes in remote in the remoteness of communities. To understand what gives rise to that, uh, there's been some research done in that. Uh, there's always this question of, uh, implicit question about, well, there's remote communities and non-remote communities, uh, a bit of a binary classification. Is there a, an actual data supported threshold that naturally distinguishes these two groups possibly? And SETS Canada has provided a, a report to that and published that just recently. Um, as we've been talking with different uh, communities, uh, they've had some questions about, well, what goes into the remoteness uh, index or index of remoteness? Uh, and one particular area of interest and uh, was uh, how ferry costs and reliability and frequency of service was incorporated into the, the analysis. And this wasn't just from Ontario communities, but it's also quite a large factor in, and, and big questions out in British Columbia, for example, as well, where there's a large reliance on, on ferries. And so there's ongoing uh, research that, um, expected to come out uh, probably mid next summer 
about refining those indexes of remoteness to better ac accommodate and account for some of these uh, specific issues that may have not been uh, thought of originally. Uh, and just a couple of other points. We as already mentioned one of the other ways to look at and, and capture the costs is actually to go out and measure cost of living data and costs in remote communities. And there's ongoing discussions about how we might do that and who we might partner with to be able to uh, actually get some on the uh, a wide portfolio and collection of on the ground data that we can use uh, either for direct inputs or any modeling work. Uh, and as uh, Deputy Grand Chief uh, mentioned as well, in terms of the National Assembly of Remote Communities, we want to be able to expand this research just beyond the NAN uh, region to incorporate other remote communities across the country. And uh, we definitely want to be able to get all of this research out and published, and we're in conversations with uh, doing that in some uh, international journals, for example, so that everyone can see all of the, the great work that is coming out of the RQ uh, table supported by uh, by Nan in, in Canada. Great. Right. That uh, basically provides us a brief update uh, of where we are and where we've been in terms of remoteness quotient uh, and RQIF research. Uh, and I'll turn it back to Deputy Baron Chief. Okay, thank you very much there, uh, David, for uh, that, uh, uh, your technical uh, uh, update there. So, like, why RQ? Why, why did we do RQ and why we continue to evolve RQ? You seem to remember, uh, you know, like when there's fixed funding pots that is coming from uh, Ontario even, they used to use the RAMA formula. And I know we all know what the RAMA formula is for all those contributing uh, First Nations. You know, 50% was calculated as uh, uh, as population, I think it was 40% was a base amount that everybody got and 10% was the account for remoteness. And that really perpetuated still the discrimination for all of our NAN communities. And they just drew a line, okay, well, uh, you only get the 10% if you're above uh, 50 second uh, parallel. You know, like, why an arbitrary uh, thing like that? So this is why we're doing uh, such an in-depth analysis of remoteness costs, uh, various degrees of remoteness, whether you're road access, or fly in communities. Uh, I want to uh, bring uh, Julian Faulkner up here to give you a sense of uh, some of those actual costs. Uh, we'll have a, a, a session of uh, question and answers right after this. But uh, uh, Julian, can you uh, uh, give a sense of uh, what some of those costs, those increased uh, funding mechanism look like so far? So, thank you, Deputy. And. Uh, just to begin with, I, I wanted to acknowledge the drum and, and the sacred item and, and the uh, elders' uh, words this morning uh, to start us in a good way. I uh, am honored to, to address you at this point, chiefs and proxies, uh, and, and, and wish to say that you should have by now a memo that's marked confidential chiefs and proxies only. Do people have that uh, memo? Uh, so this isn't an in-camera session, but because this involves uh, financial data for the agencies, it's sensitive information. It's not top secret. It, uh, you don't have to eat the memo after, after we're finished. But we want to be respectful, and so we're asking if you could please maintain the confidentiality of this document. So I'll refer to some numbers. I won't get into intense detail, um, but I, we're trying to navigate not going into in-camera every single time. We, we, you know, th there's a sensitive issue that arises. Why are we doing this? Well, we were asked, you know, what, what's the results of uh, our Q work? What are the numbers? Very fairly, we were asked that, and that's what this portion of the presentation is about. So uh, the way I would start this portion of the presentation is to respectfully say you've heard from the experts. You know, my undergrad economics degree 50 years ago ain't going to do it. So they speak to the technical expertise that uh, helps develop and model these numbers. But we have got actual numbers <laughs> in terms of how the revenues to the agencies have evolved since NAN got intervener status before the tribunal in 2016. And that's the best we can do to show your results. A couple of the issues that this is meant to address, 
is the is the one that you just heard from uh, Dr. Stiff, David Stiff, on it a minute ago. This question of who falls in the category of remoteness and who doesn't. From day one, it's sort of a, a, a consistent theme that I keep repeating to people about this work that these fine experts are doing. It's not a you're in or you're out, you're remote or you're not. It's not like that, right? It's degrees of remoteness. Does that make sense? In other words, yes, Metogamy First Nation is road access, but that doesn't mean they don't face the challenges as to degrees of remoteness. I didn't leave Mishka Gogamok out on purpose, Brenda. <laughs> but, but what I'm trying to say is it's about degrees of remoteness. And I know that the actual experts on this are you chiefs, right? You live it every day. This is your life. And you know that communities all suffer varying degrees of challenges. So we've tried to take a realistic approach to this and talk in terms of degrees of remoteness. Does that make sense? And I know I'll have to remind people about it another day, but I'm just going to keep emphasizing it's not a you're in or you're out. It used to be like that. You're remote, you're not remote. Let me give you an example. Chiging First Nation on Manitoulin Island. You talk to Chief Dabosky about the challenges of access her community faces on Manitoulin Island, south of Sault Ste. Marie, right? Degrees of remoteness. It really is an access issue. And so when we discuss this area, I'm getting into the numbers, you're going to see that serious allocations for remoteness, for example, have been made to the Wabin communities, just as an example, that may have different degrees of remoteness then, for example, the communities uh, that uh, are, are, are either further north or that have higher degrees of remoteness. So let's get into the numbers briefly. First of all, the time periods we're dealing with, we were quite careful to select the periods, the financial fiscal periods from 2017 to 2022, because that represents the time NAN gets intervener status in front of the CHRT on the case, right? You'll see at the bottom of page one that as you heard from the experts, they ascertained, okay, what would it take? This is the bottom of page one. Under, you see the word results as a title on page one. If you look below it, the experts said, in order to, to level the playing field here, you would need a 68% increase in funding for Tikkanagan. Payakatano would require a 59% increase in funding and Kunawanamano would require a 47% increase in funding, right? So right away, you see each set of communities that the particular agency serves, each are respected as needing adjustments. No, it's not Tikkanagan only, and no, it's not Paikatano only. Each community is taken into account. So that is what the experts said would be required to make it right. Now we're going to switch to how the money started coming in. So firstly, and you'll see this at the top of page two, under a title called Additional Annual Funding to Agencies, ISC did an adjustment, all right? It is only one example of how money has come in. ISC did an adjustment, and in that adjustment, they had certain allocations. That didn't cut it at all. That didn't cut it at all. And a motion was brought by NAN to enforce the phase two RQ report. And that motion, and you'll see this, you see the title halfway down page two, advanced lump sum payment to agencies and First Nations. You'll see that a motion was brought and a $28 million settlement was arrived at. The exact figure is $28,586,988. Hard number to say, but basically uh, over $28 million was the subject of a settlement. And that settlement in 2020 was based on a compliance motion in respect of the RQ report. Now what started happening is funding of the agency started happening at what they call an actuals level. In other words, what the communities faced in costs, they were going to get back, period. And you can see how that would start to actually mean what you pay, right, what you pay for a cucumber at the northern store might actually show up as a cost, what your actual costs are, if you can get a cucumber 
at the Northern Star. The numbers really make it clear at page three under agency financial statements. So now we're into the data that I said. It, it's somewhat sensitive. It's not top secret, but it's sensitive. There, the public could access the financials for the agencies. You'll see the increases. And you'll see the increases are substantial for all the agencies. But we've given you the numbers, and they're there. In some cases, in some of these agencies, I do want to be clear, the really high numbers reflect the fact that the agencies were in a growth phase. In other words, a very good example is that Kuna Wanamano was just getting off the ground in a bunch of services it was providing, so it has a really high number that reflects its increase. What I am trying to say is you are getting actual numbers here. You are getting actual, the actual increases that accounting for remoteness represents. We've asked you to consider the important follow-up that is going to be required for us to continue the work. And I'm going to stray for this, from the script for a little bit. I'm going to leave the script and go rogue. Here's what we've noticed. We're in a negotiation with Canada, and Canada says, well, we don't have data on this, right? And we say, well, okay, tell us what the challenge is for getting that data, because we want to get the funds to the communities. And I want to emphasize, by the way, a lot of these dollars are prevention dollars and dollars going to the First Nations. And even more is anticipated to go directly to the First Nations, not simply the agencies. But I was asked to report on the difference it made for the agencies, so that's why this report is the way it is. But we keep hearing, well, we're missing data on this or we're missing data on that. It is extremely helpful if the chiefs and leadership of the communities are able to work with us to gather the data in a respectful way that's confidential, but allows us to put the numbers forward to make your case for the additional funding that is essential. We can't keep our cards close to our vest and then say, you gotta pay for this, but we're not gonna tell you how much it costs. Does that make sense? I'm not saying everybody's doing that. I'm saying it's a live issue around confidentiality. And I, and I respectfully suggest, it's one way of dealing with it, that NAN is a good broker on this. That is, you can trust NAN to receive data, and then NAN will uh, anonymize it and make sure it doesn't identify communities in an inappropriate way, and then provide it so that you can have your current numbers in the system. And let me give you an example where the system is really failing right now. It, this is only my opinion, and this is where I'm going rogue. Education, all right? We're at the education reset table, and the question of the recruitment challenges for communities have come up. Obviously, I don't have to tell you, you're living it. The inability to get teachers, to attract teachers, right? Well, guess what we hear at the table? Canada gets an out, right? They get to say, well, we don't know the exact amount that the community is spending on teachers. They don't tell us. We know what they ask us for, but we don't know the exact amount. Because that's their business and we want to be respectful. So Canada's trying to be respectful. And I'm the dumb lawyer that goes, well, how can I dump on Canada if I don't actually know how much it costs? Do you see my point? So we need to get together and figure out how you would feel safe as communities in working with NAN to provide the numbers so that Deputy Grand Chief can lead the charge in negotiation to say, this is what we're spending on the teachers and it's not enough, right? We have these recruitment challenges. I mean, they say, uh, hey, we give you this isolated post allowance, just like we do with nurses, right? They say that about the teachers. Well, have you noticed you're not like, the nurses aren't stampeding the gate. Right? You've got problems in attracting federal employees who have pensions and everything else they get in the federal system. They don't show up. So that recruitment incentive is hardly good enough. And all I'm saying is it means cooperating on numbers. We want to be respectful of your privacy. We want to do this in a good way. Um, but I'm making a sort of pitch that if we're going to make a difference in these sectors, we have to figure out a way to, in a safe way, produce numbers. So I hope this was helpful, and I thank you for your time, Chiefs.
Uh, thank you, Julian. So yes, this is why we do the work. This is why we quantify remoteness, various degrees. This is what we come up with when we're negotiating uh, with all levels of government. This is why. You know, we just can't say, well, we don't have enough money. Ah, oh, we can't afford it. Okay, well, this is a concrete examples of, okay, this is what it costs. And this is what we need for needs-based uh, resourcing. In particular, this area, child and family services. But as we said before, this work had spilled into other areas like education and health. And this is where we need to collaborate and coordinate our services. So we did do this presentation at AFN, actually, uh, back in uh, November uh, 8, 2021. Uh, the Canadian Human Rights Parties uh, met in Ottawa to, uh, to have start settlement discussions and then presented, uh, we presented our RQ work and I, I started getting calls. <laughs> I started getting calls from uh, across Canada and uh, all these uh, particular areas. So uh, uh, this is where we're talking about uh, uh, the NARC. What is this NARC? Well, I'm going to put my NARC hat on right now. Is that my hat? <laughs> You thought I was just saying that figuratively, didn't you? Well, I'm going to put my NARC hat on right now. So as you know, NARC is, uh, means uh, the National Assembly of uh, Remote Communities. And uh, I have with me uh, my, our co-chair. We created uh, this National Assembly to really uh, rally other remote communities across Canada whether you'd be in uh, 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 Manitoba with MKO, uh, we have uh, AFN Northwest Territories, uh, Alberta, uh, we have uh, some charter members uh, from those particular areas. And I'd like to also uh, introduce uh, the co-chair uh, of uh, the National Assembly of uh, Remote Communities. And it's great to have uh, Vice Chief uh, David Pratt here. Uh, from FSIN, and uh, he traveled uh, all the way from Saskatchewan through storms last night uh, to be here with our chiefs to really share in some of his, uh, his community's experience with remoteness and how uh, he would like to partner uh, with NAN on really furthering uh, the issues of uh, and the challenges of remoteness because we have unique challenges that require unique solutions. So I'd like to uh, invite uh, Vice Chief Pratt uh, uh, to the stage here to do some uh, words of welcome from his communities as well. Vice Chief. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, boy, uh, the Indian Elvis is a hard act to follow. But uh, it's good to be here with you this morning. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the beautiful uh, Robinson Superior uh, Treaty Territory land that we're on today as well. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Deputy Grand Chief and uh, the staff of, uh, of NAN. I want to acknowledge uh, Grand Chief Fiddler, of course, and all the executive members that are here for all the hard work that they do on behalf of their member nations. I know it's not an easy job, you know, and, and, and of course I acknowledge the, the elder that said the opening prayer this morning uh, to start things off in a good way. And all the leaders that are here, and the, the proxies, the elders, the veterans, of course, uh, the, 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 all the people that make it possible, of course, our chair, Mr. Fiddler here, good to see you again, my friend. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here, and I know that uh, this uh, idea came about with a discussion and a, and a conversation about the, the need to deal specifically with remote and northern communities. And I know that in Saskatchewan we have a number of them too as well. And the challenges are the same there. They're, it's always a, a lack of housing, of being a main issue. Sometimes we have up to 18, 20 people living in one unit uh, up, up north in our northern areas. Uh, the cost of food is, is skyrocketing. And uh, climate change is impacting um, even the harvesting. We used to have uh, the caribou herds would come as far south as La Ronge, and La Ronge is about the middle of the province in Saskatchewan. But because of a let it burn policy that the province initiated, where they let fires just burn now and, and, and rage uncontrollably without fighting them, unless they get near infrastructure or a highway or a population center, they don't fight it anymore. 
Back in the day, they had towers, and when they seen the smoke, they'd send in the crews right away by chopper, and they'd fight the fires and put them out before they would burn. But now they just let the, the forest burn, and of course that impacts the caribou uh, from their run. And now our, our northern Dene nations are having to go north of 60 into an NWT to hunt for caribou and to follow the herds because the flora and fauna have been burnt uh, because of the forest fires. So uh, we know the challenges are, are different in our remote and northern communities. The cost of living is, uh, is, is so much higher than what we have to deal with in the south. I mean, uh, you know, you look at a, 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 a bottle of pop and the cost of, that it costs in Saskatoon to what, it, what they pay in Fond du Lac is different. Uh, a gallon of milk and uh, a lot of uh, the mines and the resource companies are up there extracting the resources from our, our, our territories and from our lands. But um, there, our people aren't benefiting or seeing the benefit from that resource extraction. So just the list goes on and on and on. And even when we pay for hydro, it's more, and this is the sad part about, about some of our northern um, nations in Saskatchewan, is that the power bills are anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000 during the winter months. So there's, the young people don't have an incentive to work because when they do get a job, whether it's in the community or in the mines, they're paying, their entire paycheck is going towards paying for hydro. So that's the challenges that we face dealing with those areas uh, uh, we face amongst our member nations in northern Saskatchewan. So I really want to commend Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse and his team for taking the initiative and providing the leadership to bring us all together and it's so that it's not just an Ontario specific position or work that's being done but it's northern Manitoba with MKO, it's FSIN in Saskatchewan, it's Treaty 8 in northern Alberta and then it's in Northwest Territories as too as well. He, all of us have come together to deal specifically with those challenges that our remote and northern uh, nations are facing and that you as chiefs face every day. Because every day you're dealing with the crises in the community. Every day you're dealing with the phone calls and child welfare. Every day you're dealing with the lack of funding and lack of resources and lack of capacity and lack, lack of capital and infrastructure across every sector, not just child welfare. So the hope and the goal of, of, of NARC is for us to be able to develop a framework for funding specific to child welfare, but at the end of the day, we want to be able to take that framework and use it in every other sector. And uh, I know that uh, Canada has committed, I think it's 15% Deputy Grand Chief right now, as a part of the long-term reform agreement, the 19.8 billion, the 2 billion for housing that's waiting, um, you know, uh, to be released once the, the deal is finalized. So, but we know that that 15% is not enough. Some people have estimated it at 32, 33% minimum. Minimum, is it 36? 36% 36 minimum. But, it's, it, but talking with some of our, our agencies, as well as our northern leadership, some believe that at the very, it, it's at least 50%. Because now we've got the cost of lumber. It's not as cheap as it used to be to build a house anymore and to get the lumber in. I mean, all the, the prices have gone up because of inflation. So what we want to do is with this table that we've developed, bring all of the, 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 the financial information together, collect as much data as, as we can, and then bring that data and develop that framework specific to child welfare, but then use it into every sector, education, health, justice, and so on and so forth. So I do want to acknowledge my co-chair, uh, Deputy Grant Chief Bobby Narcisse, uh, for the hard work that he's doing with Julian and his team. Uh, but there's a lot of work that remains to be done. We're going to be planning some engagements over the course of the next uh, few months and over the next year. We want to bring as much of our leaders together, as much of our agency uh, directors together, to hear their input, hear their say, and to collect their data. And then, at, and then at the end of the day, work on that uh, as a, a framework specific to child welfare, but using it in all the other sectors. So thank you for having me here today, Chiefs, and I look forward to sitting with you and, and spending the day with you. My flight is not out till this evening. I apologize for dressing casual today, but uh, WestJet lost my luggage. And uh, so WestJet wouldn't be WestJet if they didn't lose your luggage. So my suit is somewhere between here and Winnipeg. But uh, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to come. I appreciate being, uh, being here and I look forward to coming back 
uh, over the course of the next year or so as we continue these conversations, Chiefs. Miigwech, thank you very much. Miigwech, Vice Chief Pratt. Yes, so uh, as you mentioned that uh, we did have, we, we do have uh, some NARC uh, national uh, forums uh, that we're uh, setting up. Uh, we have uh, secured some resources to have NARC funded for the next uh, uh, five years. Uh, so we had our inaugural meeting uh, last, uh, uh, last year from May 31st to June 2nd where we looked at three different areas. Uh, the journeys of our remote communities, the realities and experiences, the vulnerabilities, you know, the settlements, safeguards and best practices that we need to uh, really share in terms of how do we uh, overcome uh, many of our challenges in these particular areas and also the science of uh, measuring our remoteness you know uh, our individual costs across uh, treaty 5 and treaty 9 and uh, nationally as well uh, and with the uncertainty uh, at the afn and uh, our, our uh, regional uh, bodies as well um, we figured that you know we it, many times our communities especially our remote communities are also Given the short end of the stick, we're always left behind. You know, we're always like at last to, uh, at, the, at the watering hole. And uh, leaders of uh, NARC, in, in terms of moving ahead, we want to ensure, uh, even at a national level, to ensure that with a united voice, we could uh, we could press our uh, our those challenges and and our uh, our priorities. Uh, as well in moving ahead with that as well. Uh, we are having a uh, meeting next week uh, to, with, our, uh, with our board members uh, across Canada to, to really look at uh, a think tank, a planning strategy uh, for our upcoming uh, national forum uh, that we're going to be having, hopefully by the end of the year, if not beginning in the new year, but we'll be coming back to let you know on how you can participate uh, in moving ahead. And a strong area that we also want to encourage is also our youth. You know, our youth, uh, our youth delegation uh, from across our remote communities also to be a part uh, of these uh, discussions and identifying our outstanding priorities in these uh, particular areas. Uh, so with that, I think I know we're a little bit over time, but uh, I'd like to put it back to our chairs. And also, uh, I don't know if we have time for questions or comments uh, from the floor, but I'll, I'll give it back to our youth chair here. Miigwech, everyone. Good job. Um, miigwech. Oh, I, was, I have a question, actually. Will this presentation be available for the chiefs and the proxies to have? Yeah. Circulated. The, the PowerPoints, uh, there's an email already to you, chiefs. The PowerPoints will be all circulated by tomorrow morning. So any of the materials you receive today will come to you also by PowerPoint. Uh, sorry, by uh, email. Oh. Okay. Yes, Chief Allen. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Narcisse. But uh, how does this impact uh, the road access communities for fairness and? Uh, Moving these fundings with the with the road access to, I know we're we're, we're considered uh, remote too. I know we're all First Nations, we're all the same. I know sometimes you talk about the short end of the stick, and sometimes when we talk about remoteness, uh, we feel like we're at the short end of the stick also. So how do we collaborate that and put that uh, at an even playing field here? So sometimes, as you said. Uh, if you look at the differences between Tikinagan and Kuinuano, that you know we're we're only at two hundred thousand for for our communities, so we have to have a a way to try to even this so everybody is the same. And when you say you want to put this to education, you want to put this to other things because that's going to impact some of our education funding that's going to go forward. Because you say you want to recruit uh, teachers, right? Now, now, how do I get to recruit uh, teachers uh, without this extra funding that's available here or recruit the best uh, child services uh, representatives that come to my community? So that this is my question. How is that going to impact the road access here? I'm only speaking on 
Yeah, for Quantas Lake, but there's other road access communities in Nan here that are, are going to probably ask the same question. Miigwech. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Allen, for that question. Yes, and that was the thing, like even, um, it all stems also, like I, I mentioned, uh, how RAMA was distributed as well and how they arbitrarily put like the 10% remoteness and you can only get it from, if you're above uh, the 51st parallel. And that left out a lot of our road access communities, whether it be uh, Constance Lake or Aroland, Ganugaming, 58, uh, Wabin communities as well. And that's why, like, we were talking about the various degrees of remoteness. Uh, like, uh, just because we didn't want to paint remoteness with just fly-in communities. Because as you know, like uh, you just mentioned yourself, uh, you have uh, access issues as well. Uh, costs are also associated with leaving your community. Uh, so those are also taken into account uh, when we're doing uh, that those economic analysis that all the, all those particular areas and it would also reflect your costs your actual costs and that's what uh, our experts also took into consideration what are the actual costs of, of delivering those services or or the actual cost of recruitment uh, for your particular road access uh, community uh, we didn't want to paint everybody with the same brush uh, with this research so uh, in collaboration with you and your communities and other communities for that matter uh, we want to identify what are those various degrees of remoteness so it could interpret into the actual needs-based costs of your communities to to really develop those mechanisms deliver those services attract recruit, recruit, recruitment as well uh, Julian you want to follow up on some of those areas that you mentioned yeah and, and Chief Allen if you, if you look at uh, the first page of that memo You'll see that the experts in uh, talking about the shortfalls, right? So the bottom of page one under the, the title results says, you know, they identify that 59% adjustment for Piacatano and Kunawanamano would require a 47% adjustment. Well, I don't have to tell you, Chief, you know that, uh, you know, whether we're talking about Piacatano in terms of servicing uh, some of the communi communities or Kunawanamano, there's many road access communities that fall under those agencies. The point is, the, it's the access challenges that define you as remote. It's you're remote from access points. I don't have to tell you, you experience it. So it is taken into account and then you flip over to uh, page um, three, third page, you'll see the increases in funding. Hardly only increases in funding for fly-ins. There's significant increases in funding for agencies that service road access communities. And then on top of that, now this is really important, you go beyond the agencies and talk about the prevention dollars that are flowing under the agreement in principle. So now I'm switching over to the deal that's been signed, the agreement in principle uh, for long-term reform. You should know, Chief, that first and foremost are the funds going to the First Nations, not the agencies. First and foremost are the funds going to the First Nations. And there's a pledge in paragraph 100, and if uh, I can ask uh, uh, technical to put up paragraph 100 on the, uh, on the board. Uh, what you'll see in that paragraph, and I want to emphasize you'll see it, I won't because I can't find my glasses, but paragraph 100 actually uh, is quite clear in terms of setting out the priorities and the priorities involve uh, actually looking at a remoteness index for the communities. And what I'm talking about in that respect and I'll just pull it up on my screen, is the fact that a remoteness adjusted indexed exercise is going to happen. The remoteness index shall be applied to the program's amounts for baseline funding, etc. The reformed funding approach shall adjust and index the funding as set out to account for increased costs associated with remoteness. And you see how it's not increased costs for flying communities. It's increased costs associated with remoteness. And that's why I use the example of Chiging on Manitoulin Island. I didn't mean to leave out your communities, Chief, but obviously they're road access. For crying out loud, they're two hours from Sudbury, <laughs> right? But the access challenges they face, well, we all know about. And what I'm really trying to say is that's what gets measured. And that's meant 
to get rid of the old style that Deputy Grand Chief referred to, you're in or you're out, north of the 52nd parallel or, or not. So that's how the approach is being taken. And uh, you're quite right in emphasizing you need to be assured it's going to work to your advantage. And I'm going to ask the same screen to turn up paragraph 104 of the agreement. And this is just ending, ending my answer. Paragraph 104 talks about the creation of a remoteness secretariat, Chief. Do we have that up? 104? Just got to flip down. That's it. Here we go. Bingo. 104. The dedicated remoteness secretariat shall be responsible for data collection, analysis, and operational support for a NARC Canada remoteness table. The remoteness secretariat shall also act as a hub for best practices and help to disseminate research and tools to assist First Nations leadership and service providers with respect to accounting for remoteness issues. The point is, this is a big push to create real data and is the exact opposite of a 10% casino rama formula, right? And so that's the answer. We're not there yet, but we're pushing hard to gather the data so that you're getting the appropriate allocation. I mean, it's changed. There is a letter of September 2020 from Grand Chief Abrams from the South complaining that too much money is starting to flow to the North, right? Now, how's that for a change? And so it is changing, it is changing. But it's not changing fast enough, obviously. Okay. Thank you. Is there any more? Oh, yes. Oh, wait, what do I? Hi, can I get a chief to recognize uh, the Women's Council, please? Chief Tuido recognizes you, Women's Council. Thank you, uh, Chief Toledo. Good morning, uh, NARC. Um, I've been, um, I've always uh, had, uh, I always uh, uh, watch um, child welfare issues. It's always been a passion for me since I uh, started uh, my leadership role. And uh, one of the things that um, I, I always think about is that you cannot leave a community out in regards to any kind of um, um, when uh, you know even remoteness. Like you know, we are a drive-in uh, road, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I believe we have another community that has already made a, an all-season road. See, the impact that we're going to have is that if we're considered an all-season road, then you know what the remoteness is the factor is taken away. So I don't think that's, uh, I don't agree with that. And I don't like being left out, you know, especially in terms of our children. And a lot of things that I didn't get any of that, um, but I kind of was following along. You know, um, the child welfare agencies that we have and that we are, that are recognized in the ministry, probably under um, um, one of the, the, what is it? But anyways, <laughs> The reason why um, I, I'm talking about those is because um, we have to start recognizing our ban rep right. and our prevention programs. I did not agree with the part that the ban, ban uh, prevention program dollars went through an agency, a certain portion of it. Mm -hmm. It should not have gone that way. The, all the prevention dollars should, came, should have came to the First Nation. Mm -hmm. It should have. And uh, furthermore, I want to say that um, I've always been against the remoteness caution uh, based on our casino rama dollars. That was introduced mm -hmm. to me back when I was first uh, uh, back in um, one of the chiefs meetings when I first started. And I didn't agree with it then. I still don't agree with it today mm -hmm. because it should be based on need. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, uh, our community, I'm just going to speak on behalf of my community, we, have a, we, have, we just had a big birth rate, you know. And then... Um, I know, I know that a lot of times, I, and, I, and this uh, ticks me off, is that the Section 10 of the best interest of a child is based on their culture, right? But the best interest of a child in my culture is that we meet the needs of that child, all the children that are going to be growing up in that uh, situation. The highest rate of um, people in, uh, in peoples in Canada, the ones that will be touched upon by Child Welfare Agency is First Nations. Mm -hmm. 
and that's got to stop, you know. And then, like you know, with all these other programs, those are the where those are where the dollar those those are the places that we need the dollars to be increased. So I think when you go back to your tables, you know, I think um. And also, I always uh, stress this out because of the opiate crisis. You know, when you see everything goes hand in hand, it does go hand in hand. We have to start looking at um, start looking at the impacts of these, um, especially in terms of our children. So, in regards to um, having the short end of the stick and the lack of funding, mm -hmm. that's what we were always going to hear. You know, and I'm sick of it. Mm -hmm. That the money should be coming to our communities. We're not waiting to get rich on anything. We want to make sure our children are taken care of. So anyhow, um, um, can I have a copy of your presentation? I didn't get anything. So I just kind of did my notes. Thank you. No, thank you, Brenda. Always uh, great to have you uh, uh, share your, uh, your insight and your guidance. And uh, also as a member of our Chiefs Committee on Children, Youth, and Families, uh, your, your voice is very valuable there. Uh, yes, no, that these are... Uh, I know we are talking about the RQ work and the, and the funding that is required uh, for our First Nations to do the work that needs to happen. Uh, yes, and th that's a movement that, uh, uh, that we're moving towards. Like The mandate has always said that resources go straight to the First Nation. And examples of that is the First Nations rep, the band rep, uh, choose life, family well-being, the prevention dollars that are going. It goes straight to the First Nation community to be developed at the, at the community uh, level. And uh, how we're quantifying that and the amount is through the work that we're doing with the RQ and all the work that's, that's happening there. Uh, did you have a supplementary question? I, know, uh, uh, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, for the ban rep and prevention programs, those stats should be collected as is with the Kinagan and uh, the other uh, child welfare agencies because those are the ones, they're the ones doing the grassroots work. Mm -hmm. Yep, no thank you for that. and they're, like adding to that, there needs to be more of a collaboration uh, and direction taken from the First Nation uh, to the agency as well, because there needs to be cooperation in that. Uh, like I said in my, uh, my, my presentation at the beginning, we have to move from apprehension to prevention. You know, like uh, we have to focus on helping the family, and these are different technical ways that we could do that. Uh, Proxy uh, Munez. Hello. <clears throat> Miigwech uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm a proxy for Nishkandaga First Nation. Chief Munias is back home now, so mm -hmm. uh, um, just wanted to share uh, some comments on the presentation. Also, uh, I guess bringing it back from the community's perspective to where we are at, actually at right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think the realities really do take into account what our communities and what our people go through, mm. uh, whatever formulas, whatever uh, approaches are being uh, are being uh, carried out. Like for example, um, we our communities, most of our communities are in a state of crisis right now, and those those considerations are not being made to enhance the uh, the levels that our communities. Uh, desperately need and should be afforded with those things. Like what what considerations are being made when our communities are still living in poverty, when they're still living in boil water advisories, when they're when they have a housing housing crisis, when they have a mental health state of emergency for my community, for example, since 2013. Like those are considerations that are often uh, put on a sideburn, but. To be honest, uh, the way these formulas are reached out, um, the realities are not really there when it comes to uh, how, how much does uh, our communities get, how much support does our people get. Like when you're dealing with an ongoing crisis in communities like, like our non-First Nation communities that, that often are in those situations, uh, those considerations are often uh, put on the sideburn. And that's clear because uh, there's so much gaps that are, uh, that are clearly uh, there in our, in our communities when it comes to child welfare, when it comes to education, when it comes to a lot of things. So uh, I think that's, the, uh, that's something that should be uh, maybe looked into a little bit more. 
How can you realistically say this is what our communities need? This is the, the context or the complexities that our communities are going through right now. How do you address those things? How do you bridge those, those gaps? I know, uh, I know for a fact that our community always gets uh, left, left out. What happens when a community uh, gets evacuated? We've, we've experienced those types of things in our communities where because of water, we got evacuated twice in our community. And we dealt with a lot of issues. The chief and council and the leadership dealt with a lot of those communities. And still, the level of support and services that are often mm -hmm. being provided are still the same. There's extraordinary circumstances that the formulas, whatever formulas are, are, are are reached often don't consider. We know that the government of Canada, the Crown has uh, failed its uh, its duty to uh, to our to our people when it comes to uh, really acknowledging and uh, providing the necessary supports that they need in order to do their what they need to do. And uh, I just wanted to share that because I, I know the important work that's being done by uh, by your team, Deputy Grand Chief, and your uh, the hard workers that you have in your mm -hmm. in your team. However, I think we we have to bring these other issues at the forefront when we're dealing with uh, how we're going to support our communities. How are we going to address those gaps that are that are evident in our communities? And the reality often sometimes doesn't translate into what we come up with or what the government comes up with. And I think that has to be, uh, that has to be, um, that gap has to close. Because we're going we're gonna to keep uh, uh, dealing with these issues. These issues are always going to come up if those gaps are not, uh, are not addressed. Uh, so I just wanted to share that because I, 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 I do... Uh, I do uh, understand the presentation. I do the, understand the um, the significance and the importance uh, to those to our communities about uh, some of the work that uh, the the Grand Chief, the Deputy Grand Chief, is doing and his team, and uh, why it's so critical to also look at the other issues that I mentioned. I just uh, used some of those examples, but uh, but clearly uh, we have some work to do and. Uh, Certainly, I think that's the work that needs to be also uh, taken into account. So, miigwech, miigwech. Miigwech, proxy uh, Wayne Munias for those uh, very vital and very important comments and bringing that perspective uh, from, uh, from your community. And I think it's also shared by all of our communities here that we have to really look at all those social determinants of health and those underlying issues and those outstanding uh, priorities. I know. The focus of RQ was child and family services, but uh, we know that there's other areas that we need to really coordinate our efforts, whether it be in housing or clean drinking water, food security, mental health. And I think uh, with the work of our uh, executive as well and, and uh, your First Nations here, uh, your tribal councils, there needs to be a coordination of a strategy, a coordination of services that need to happen with all these initiatives that we're bringing to bear here there's these past uh, few days. So uh, looking forward to working with your communities uh, on identifying those uh, priorities too. So, Chair. Thank you. Closing on Oh. Yes, Chief Tuito. Hello. I just want to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, Bobby Narcisse and his team for uh, working on this particular uh, topic of uh, remoteness and overall. Because, um, you know, when we talk about funding and all that, we always have a shortfall. You know, and, uh, and the other areas of... Uh, funding like education and so on, you know, those have to come into play too, into the picture. You know, we talk about child welfare also, which is uh, important also, but, uh, you know, we, uh, it's important that we get everything on, on there because, uh, you know, like we talk about education too, how very important it is for our, um, for our children, you know, because uh, that's the key. 
education is the key to success. I truly believe that. And, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, you see our youth there, Scott Dizirg and Women Council and elders, you know, uh, just uh, listening to them, you know, their knowledge that they share and the youth and the women, you know, just, uh, it's uh, very, uh, what do you say, uh, I'll just say that it's, uh, they're very caring and, you know, and they give out what they can give out. And I'm really especially proud of the youth that, that have aged out, you know, I'm so, you guys are role models, I just want to say that to them and rec recognize them, you know, I'm so proud of the youth there. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done yet, and, uh, and uh, we need to move on and get this on the show here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mia. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Tweedo. Yeah, you know I'm a showman, so I'll, I'll get the show on the road here. Yeah, it's good. And thank you for acknowledging our youth and our youth at Shkadzik Council. They're, uh, you know, they're an integral part of a lot of the work that we do as well, so. Uh, oh my God. Oh, Chief Russell Wesley, uh, this one's going to be the final comment. Uh, final comment. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to wait till the last minute. Um, remote remoteness quotient. It has to do with. Uh, the funding levels that we receive in my community compared to what it should actually be. That's my understanding of that remoteness quotient. I am very slow this morning. It's been a tiring few days with things happening in my community. Mm. But um, I'm trying to frame in my mind what I wanted to say about the remoteness quotient. But to me, remoteness quotient is not just about uh, child welfare. Mm -hmm. Child welfare or child welfare is linked to many other issues and situations uh, that we face in our communities. Everything from uh, education to uh, um, end of life care for our uh, elders. All of those things are linked together. And rather than approaching the situation on purely remote in we, we should be looking at this as a program where, where we discuss remoteness quotient on um, on a variety of program levels. Uh, not too long ago, I had a, a discussion in concept with the ISC on long-term care homes and the situation around uh, our elder care. The biggest factor with caring properly for our elders is the lack of facilities, infrastructure, and capital funding. It, it cannot be done because of the cost factor alone, uh, whether it's uh, regionally or nationally. So a different approach has to be made. And again, remoteness is a factor, particularly for uh, communities like mine you know, or any other remote communities. So it, we, got it, we got it to a level where... Um, where uh, the discussion led to the concept of a pilot project because of the concept that we were proposing that included uh, uh, a circle of life approach in long-term care home. Again, children are involved. We have programs. Um, you know, we have to we have to be innovative in how we approach these issues that we deal with on a daily basis. Like in the early years, as an example, mm -hmm. 
we have children that are uh, entering the uh, education system at early years. They're, they're uh, developing mentally, they're developing physically, they're developing spiritually. You know, we attempt to provide these uh, growth uh, services for, for our children at early years. And then there's Head Start. You know, all, all, those, all through those phases of a children's uh, growth cycle, there's knowledge transfer occurring regardless of what type of education it is, including language and culture. Language and culture is really important for our communities because in my community, I, I would venture to say that I've had at least 70% loss in language. Mm -hmm. Those are huge numbers, huge numbers. And this is why I'm saying that uh, you know, when we're trying to deal with funding issues, you can't just isolate it into one, one sector. It has to be approached collectively, and then the whole range of our our, uh, our children's uh, life cycle. You know, when you, I'm just using long-term care home as an example to funding long-term care homes because because what you're doing there is you're including the whole life cycle event, and each of these sectors are funded. And when you're doing these things, you're justifying the cost of long-term care homes when, when you're approaching them on a circle of life uh, mm -hmm. perspective. You know, you're, you're born and then you die, so you go through a complete life cycle. And, um, but I'm not sure where, where the whole long-term care home is at the time. I haven't, uh, I haven't touched it in six months or so. What I'm encouraging is that we, we change the approach on the whole remoteness quotient and, mm -hmm. and approach it on a program basis and possibly even create a new program within NAN to, 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 to deal with issues like information management and data management. Those things, those things are key factors in order for us to justify our, agreement, our, uh, our disputes with ISC and, and uh, the federal and provincial governments. That is the thing that we lack the most all the time is information and data. And during COVID, we had that problem. It was very evident that we did not have information, we did not have data, and, and it was a huge barrier in, in uh, overcoming many of the barriers that we faced during COVID. And we had to be extremely, extremely vocal to, you know, to represent our concerns uh, during that period. So there, there is a need, a, a huge need, for information and data management. Mm -hmm. And that would be a critical program for us to have that would uh, aid all the various programs that we have involving children, women, and uh, elders, and all the programs we have. Like right now, I'm sitting in my community. I, I don't have any teachers. Mm -hmm. I don't have adequate housing for my teachers, and that affects uh, my education outcomes severely. And that happens right across the board in our communities. And the reason why we don't have teachers is we don't have we can't justify the numbers because there's no collective approach to dealing with the teacher issue. I'm just citing these things as to why it's information important that we have information and data management. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. No, thank you uh, for those comments, Chief Wesley, and totally correct. And uh, we want to uh, undertake a process of uh, information data collection that is uh, rooted at the First Nation level. Many times the perpetuation of discrimination still exists when you are being funded on these particular areas, when you have uh, incomplete data, when even even your birth registrations, your, your, your First Nations ban lists, uh, your, your, right, your inherent right or jurisdiction, uh, having jurisdiction over your children or your families, wherever they may reside, uh, is also uh, in question. You know, like uh, your, your, uh, uh, the people that are on your list, your, your ability to say, well, they're a part of our First Nation. Those, those data, those information lists are not, uh, uh, are not, uh, 
at times recognized, and this is what we want to change by uh, developing those information and data systems as well. And I totally agree. Uh, we need to come at this with a coordinated effort. We need to tear down those silos uh, in these particular areas because the work has uh, 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 ramifications in all sectors. And while it is acknowledged that NARC has been established in the context of global resolution discussions around settlement of outstanding claims against Canada in context of child welfare, uh, like the work that uh, Vice Chief Pratt and I are doing, is an intended to represent advocacy voice across sectors, uh, not limited to just child welfare, but there is an opportunity to, uh, like we said, it, it has ramifications in health, social, housing, um, all these particular areas. And the fact that uh, uh, there is a lack of capital investments and in infrastructure in our communities, those are areas that also we want to bring to bear. Uh, yeah, and that's, uh, that's a part of our mission statement at the NARC is to really look at these areas, uh, not just in child welfare, but how it could also have a profound impact uh, in many other areas uh, and priority areas uh, that we have. I just also, in my closing too, uh, I want to reiterate um, this, this information booklet that I passed out on day one. Like I said, uh, you asked for it. And we delivered in terms of what is available in terms of funding in these particular areas, whether it be capital investments, your band reps, uh, your prevention dollars, how you could use them. It's all in here. We have staff here that's uh, readily available to you as well to, to help you navigate uh, through those particular uh, program areas. And we'll continue uh, to help you in those uh, particular areas as well. So make sure you get a copy of this. There's also an online version of it as well. So uh, those are uh, funding that you uh, can continue to access and evolve at the community level. So uh, with that too, in my closing, I'd like to really recognize our guests uh, from FSIN, uh, Vice Chief Pratt. Uh, I'm sorry there's not a change of clothes in here or socks in here, but I know hopefully your luggage will be uh, found. But uh, uh, here's some uh, a gift and all that for you and so, so looking forward to working with you again. Yes, so. for sure. I just want to once again thank you, uh, Deputy Grand Chief, for the good work that you and Julian are doing in your team. Uh, seeing all the reports and all the support that's here for the Chiefs is really encouraging. It's, uh, it's pushing me to do a better job too at FSA and seeing uh, how advanced NAN is in terms of the child welfare file and the good work that's going on. So I just want to reassure the Chiefs, you are represented by good leadership. You are represented by good, uh, trust me, I've seen a lot of leaders in my time. Some good, some bad, some not so good. And uh, Deputy Grand Chief uh, has a good understanding of the files, strong advocate, and uh, he's doing a good job. And it's an honor for me to be able to work with him. And uh, I'm hoping that we can uh, do our best to represent our Chiefs and to do some good work here so we can see those increases across the board, not just in child welfare, but in every other sector that you're dealing with too as well. So once again, Miigwech, thank you very much, Chiefs. Yeah. Also, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your staff here, uh, Lucas, uh, has come a long way with you. Lucas, we got a, a parting gift for you too. Lucas keeps the uh, Vice Chief in line as well, so. Uh, yeah. Good to have you here. Yeah. Oh, good, right on. Not a jacket for fall. Thank you. <laughs> Feels yeah. like fall weather already, so thank you, big witch. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, Dr. Cook, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation here as well, and your ongoing uh, commitment to this work. And uh, thank, you very uh, thank you so much. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. All right, then we'll take it back to our chair. Miigwech, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Grand Chief. Now I'm going to pass it over to my co-chair, Connie. I was just saying that the professionals are looking younger and younger. <laughs> anyway, okay, so we are at 1.30 now. So this is what I'm going to recommend. Um, Sidebar with uh, Victor um, to do the blessing for the lunch. 
And then if we could have people go, not everyone at the same time, um, grab lunch, and then we go into a working lunch, and then we'll go right into the next topic. So I'm going to call Victor up to do the blessing, and then individually go grab a lunch, and then we'll get right into the Moses Beaver inquest. Yeah, we're just going to continue on as you're going for your lunch. Okay? Uh, let's all stand. As we say the blessing over the food, um, we'll pray uh, for the family in uh, Cat Lake that lost the 15-year-old uh, the yesterday. And for those communities that have, uh, are still suffering loss, it just it seems like we just don't have any break, just no time to breathe. So, But uh, as leaders, it's a uh, tough load to carry. But let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful day that you have given us. We thank you for our chiefs, our proctors, our citizens that are sitting here, all the technicians and the staff. We ask for a blessing upon the food that it would nourish our body and just uh, we we are uh, we say a special prayer this morning, uh, this afternoon for uh, Cat Lake. The communities have been affected by death. That you'd comfort and strengthen our people, our the mothers, the fathers, the. the grandparents and every citizen that's been touched by grief and loss that you would just help us during this hard time as we continue business give us wisdom and understanding and as we move these important items forward we ask this in jesus name amen thank you victor so we are going to go uh continue on with our agenda um i'm going to call up uh, deputy grand chief anna betty at jibijat And don't forget to sign in. If you haven't signed in this morning and this afternoon, please sign in. And I guess as well, um, as you are grabbing your lunch to have, if you're going to have discussions, um, to have them quietly somewhere where we can't hear it up here because it's it's distraction. And as well, there is a celebration of life taking place across the hall. So just kind of move your discussion down the hall. All right. Okay, so with that, I'd like to call um, Deputy Grand Chief Anna Betty up. And I really need to go to the bathroom. Okay. Also, last night at the banquet, there was a ring found. So, if anybody's uh, missing a ring, there, there was a ring found. Adam's looking at his hand. Okay. <coughs> okay. The main. Uh, pr uh, the main. Uh, priority for um, placing uh, this particular item was uh, it's entitled um, the inquest of Moses Beaver uh, I, I just for those that may not know um, Moses Beaver was uh, an individual who who died um, at um, at the Thunder Bay Correction, at the Thunder Bay District Jail, and and because he died um, in a, in a correction facility, it is mandatory that an inquest be held. Nishnabe Aski Nation was um, had intervener status, and. They were part of making recommendations, as well as the others in the, the other groups that had intervener status, uh, which included Nishnabe Aski Police Services, because Moses had um, had been transported uh, from his community of Nibinemic, um, and the findings was that uh, 
that he didn't have proper service uh, to, uh, to address his needs. And, and it resulted um, where the police was the only resource that, was, that were um, able to uh, respond to him. And he was transported by Orange and Orange was also uh, part of the inquest. And there is a resolution that is part of your package that we are requesting that you review. And um, we are um, asking uh, for your support by passing this resolution so that we can proceed with um, the involvement and advocacy of implementation of the recommendations. So that is what we're looking for um, with this particular um, agenda item. Mingwich. So Connie, I, I do believe it was. So we will check with the staff and see how many um, delegates we have in the room for this resolution. We do need to have 23 delegates in order to, to address the resolution. And if we can have the resolutions committee um, put the resolution up on the screen. Okay, there it is. How many do we have? How many? Thirteen? So we have thirteen. Is that counting all the ones at the lunch? <laughs> <laughs> at the buffet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the hungry, we have thirteen in the room. So we could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we do have 13 delegates and we need 23. So what we could do is put this resolution um, when we get to the resolutions part of our agenda. So with that, um, I think that's what we'll go ahead and do. And um, even with the, all the people at the lunch buffet, we don't have quorum to deal with this resolution. So with that, I'm going to go right into the next um, agenda item, which is going to be All right, I'm going to hand it back to the youth co-chair. Hello, so I'm introducing the Kinachi pre uh, presentation. So I'd like to invite up uh, Angela Carter and Ignis Gull from Kinachi. How many minutes do I have, Mr. Chairman? Wachik, Wachik, Ogumahanak, Wachik, Chiefs, 
My name's uh, Ignis Gull. I'm from uh, Arawapskat. And I'm with uh, Kanachihi uh, Treatment Center in Thunder Bay, as well as uh, we look after the, uh, the Healing Lodge uh, in Sulikot and uh, the Timmins, the Timmins one. And we have a report that we uh, uh, probably it was included in your uh, package. And before I go ahead, I just wanted to uh, uh, say hello to all the, uh, the chiefs, elders, and proxies, delegates, and uh, guests that are uh, at this meeting. And I want to uh, congratulate uh, Alvin Fittler, the Grand Chief of the Anishinaabeiski Nation. Uh, Council, but yeah. Anyways, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know we do this every year on an annual basis over the last uh, 20 years or so. <clears throat> we presented the reports to the chiefs at this forum, non forum, and uh, we also. Uh, to the financial statements, the auditor has here to do the financial statements, and also Angela Carter, who is the CEO of Kanachihi, is here to uh, talk about something uh, something else that she needs uh, from the chiefs. And uh, you know, without uh, going any further, the uh, report is uh, self-explanatory. You know, everything's in the report. If you have any questions about the report, uh, you can talk to Angela Carter, or you can talk to me. I'll be here the rest of the day. And uh, but one of the things I wanted to mention is that uh, I stepped down as the chairman of Kanachihi after 25 years being the, uh, the chair with the board of directors. And uh, you know, I have seen quite a bit of my, quite a bit uh, of time over the last 25 years I've been around in trying to help our people that are coming to the center, the Kanachihi Treatment Center, as well as the uh, healing lodges that were recently recently. Um, constructed or renovated in Solicout and uh, at Timmins. And the COVID-19 uh, really uh, delayed quite a bit of the, the work that uh, we were doing when the ministry and NAN came to us to uh, build or find a way to uh, lease existing buildings for the two healing lodges that were built in Sulikaut and uh, one in Timmins. Uh, everything was delayed uh, due to COVID-19, construction, renovation, staffing, purchasing equipment, supplies, moving ahead with everything everything that uh, we needed to uh, satisfy the, uh, the city with the zoning bylaws and that kind of stuff. You know, that's something that, uh, something that happened over the last uh, pretty well four years now. But one of the things I want to uh, mention to you, as an elder, I'm 76 years old, and I feel I have the obligation to talk to you about something that, uh, that's been bothering me over the last few years. I have seen so much so much loss of human life in my community in Arawapskat. And I also understand it's not just Arawapskat. This is happening all over in our uh, First Nation communities. The major, major deaths that I've seen is coming from the illegal uh, drugs, 
Machinto Corona. The poisonous trucks that are coming to our communities. And it has devastated the community. I have seen young mothers, young dads die from overdose. And I have seen young children left behind when their mom and dad died, died as a result of an overdose. Because there's too much they're illegal drugs. That's what destroying our communities. And it becomes an emotional, emotional livelihood in our communities. It's hurting the whole community, hurting young families, hurting young dads, moms, parents, elders. And I'm not sure how that's going to be dealt with in the future because it's not changing fast enough. Nothing's happening, happening too fast enough to deal with those issues. The chief from Nishkanika and the proxy from Nishkanika, Wayne Munias, speak to us just a few minutes ago, and, he, and he, he's right. He's talking about the crisis that First Nations are facing right now. In the meantime, you know, we hear about the, uh, the other reports, the, the, good, the good work that's happening right now, but it's not happening fast enough. Muniki can we, but it doesn't happen fast enough. We talk about the lack of housing, overcrowding. We lost uh, quite a few people in our Wapscat during uh, COVID-19 because of uh, overcrowding. And I'm sure that happened in each uh, community, all the communities. And I think that's something that uh, we need to uh, remember. Kanachihi cannot handle everything that comes to the doors of uh, every treatment center or healing lodges. You know, people come to our uh, healing lodges with different, multiple uh, crises, such as multiple uh, health issues, multiple uh, medication. They have families back home. They have children back home. And that affects everybody. That affects the, the youth when they come for uh, looking for a treatment. Uh, we can only do as much as we can. As a treatment center, a group that, uh, how we can help. You know, we, we need more, uh, we need more beds, we need more spaces, we need more uh, aftercare programs uh, back home for when the clients uh, go home, either they get discharged or they discharge themselves. And that's something that uh, we have to uh, remember. But without any further due to uh, other things, you know, I, I've heard this stuff over the last uh, 30 years, 40 years. You know, I might sound like a broken record every time I say something because uh, it's not happening fast enough and uh, our communities are facing crisis too many crises, so we need to look at that. But anyway, I'll ask the, uh, the auditor to come uh, and present the uh, financial statements. Uh, is Dead Scully in here? Or? Yeah. Miigwech. Yeah. 
Hello, so they had a resolution, but we don't have quorum right now. So I believe we're going to push this till this afternoon. Um, Miigosh, I'd like to invite up my fellow co-chair, Connie. So we will do with the resolution when we get to um, the resolution section of our agenda, as it, at this time we don't have quorum. So I'm going to call upon uh, uh, Deputy Grand Chief Anna Betty to do the uh, 50th anniversary um, section of our agenda. Mingwich, I do know that uh, I uh, and acknowledge that some of our chiefs uh, um, are had to uh, leave the room, and uh, hopefully uh, they'll return after one, so that uh, we could um, uh, continue on with some of the resolutions that um, that we still have yet to pass. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, um, take a, a few a few minutes to uh, acknowledge that this year, 2023, represents 50 years um, since Nishnabe Aski Nation has been put in place, and. You know, we have uh, many uh, former leaders that we make reference to when we talk about, uh, you know, the, the vision and our, our mission and how we wanted to, uh, you know, be independent and how we wanted to ensure that we were protecting our lands and our waters and our treaty. And we make reference to those uh, individuals at times. And also we make, uh, you know, we honor those individuals. Many of the people that, uh, that spoke um, may not have had um, official titles, but their voices are, are part of uh, those visions because the leadership would bring the voices of their people to these forums, to these assemblies. So we must always, we must always uh, keep that in mind when we talk about our history. And um, so we're going to, uh, we wanted to uh, uh, show some, uh, some pictures that we have, that we have in collection. And uh, we're going to be running through uh, these photos uh, uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. There's a, there's a, some of them, some of the photos you will recognize and might have been in your community. You'll see some of our former leaders there. And uh, so we wanted to uh, um, share that with you. And we also want to, um, uh, share an honor song for um, the people of Nishnabe Aski Nation. And, um, and I also have uh, a gift for um, the NAN uh, executive. Uh, I guess once uh, Grand Chief uh, and, uh, and Deputy uh, Linklater come back, I will, um, okay. Then, uh, but uh, we don't have our uh, our drum here yet.
something very similar in these photos. It demonstrates pride. It, de it demonstrates and shows our, conne our connection to uh, the land and our culture. We should always be proud of that. that was there demonstrates uh, the grassroots people that when we decide to take a stand that we come together and our children we recognize the importance of uh, of the value of our children and the need to empower them as well to hear their voices many times we talk about how anything that we're doing is for our children Our staff are going to be handing out uh, jackets that were specially made um, for our NAN chiefs to, uh, in recognition of our 50th year anniversary.
Miigwech. No. Miigwech, uh, Jeffrey Gunchy, friend of Betty. And to the staff that put in a lot of effort to, uh, uh, to commemorate the, uh, the, the creation of this organization uh, 50 years ago. I'm here, George M. Kondoyako, George M. Kondoyako, Gagi, Mr. Yan Kiwaj, where Gagi was towards where and Kiwin there, Pamojigan. Uh, Grand Council Treaty Number Nine, Stamgagis and Kadega, up in the good uh, uh, Treaty Five communities. Now I get up in the good Nagi in the Guinea PDS work. We up in the good the Sabas Gis and Kagis and Kagis and Kadek. And I think it's a good opportunity for us just to remind ourselves and to remind each other. Um, I'm looking at Elvis over here on the, <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> Uh, why the Stai Basque was created? I didn't hear Kaguj and Kadamwats, Wajus Chadek and Kiu Mujigun. And there are so many people uh, that, uh, that need to be acknowledged, uh, too many uh, to name, I'm sure, but there's, uh, there's a few uh, that stand out, like the inaugural uh, Grand Chief. Andrew Record and the executive, sort of the, the founding fathers, the founding members of NAN, and that uh, we just lost one recently uh, from Monument Lake, uh, Chris Cromarty. Uh, from what I can understand, the, uh, and I know Wally's here as well, uh, I was involved in, in, in those early days. Uh, there was a president, there were vice presidents. And later on, uh, were changed to Grand Chief and Deputy Grand Chief. And there's so many, so many people that put a lot, a lot of their, their heart and soul in, in creating this, uh, this organization. And so we owe them a lot. And I think the only way that we can honor their work and their legacy is for us to keep on uh, carrying on that the work that they started 50 years ago. And to not be afraid to, to show courage in carrying out this work. Um, and some of them are still alive, with, uh, are still with us, and we need to find ways to continue to honor them and their families and communities. So, Megan is a buggy, he could be on, and Akumangi, who are guys sick, I don't know about the man who are up in the goods, Nyanab Danawiake. Uh, um, there is a document. There is a document there uh, that was included in your meeting kits, just for your your reference. Kagi no jo jeke de mek anin hiwe nistam kagi napin madan kadek. They had a a, a document uh, that's uh, uh, that they called basic issues and priorities of Grand Council Tree Number Nine. I'm aware the system guy Google Mac notes, Google Mac and Andy record. I give, I give, I mean, I can give them to him. I would give strong one in a bad band. And I'm sure if you were to go through it, that many of those issues and priorities that they identified uh, back in the beginning are still very much with us and they're still very, very relevant. Uh, and that's why we need to carry on with the work. Egumina, Hiwaga, we got to when you can the Mac, Gagi, Kidwat, you were the guiding principles, and they included three words in the Nishnai Basque Nation, you in the logo unity, strength, and success. Zimamo, we don't keep a dick. Uh, we don't always agree on issues on everything, but at the end there has to be uh, um, 
I'm I'm sure there's other materials uh, that we can gather. Uh, I know uh, the uh, Ojibwe Creek Cultural Center, Timmins, they have uh, a lot of resource materials too that, that we can utilize uh, to uh, turn into a package for, for leaders, for our young people. So, um, anybody you want to do the honors? Do you want to ask the drum to render the? Amiwa, I'm going to go to the to do an honor song to remember all our past leaders, our elders, uh, those that have left us, and those that are still with us.
What a beautiful tribute to the, the work that's been done by our past leaders to bring us to this time in history. Thank you, Anna Betty, for your good work. And thank you for your words, um, Grand Chief Fiddler. And thank you for the, the beautiful song. So we will be um, going into in camera, but before we do, um, I just want to announce that the gender-based violence survey that was done, there was um, a prize for that, and the winner is Lefty Cam. So Lefty, give him a round of applause, won himself a gift card, a $100 gift card. Not $10,000, get the... Congratulations. So with that, I'm going to give it over to um, co-chair Adam Fiddler to bring us into in-camera. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We'll spend it all on one. <laughs> Okay, miigwech, uh, Connie. Uh, so it's uh, quarter after one. Uh, next agenda item is uh, in camera, as uh, indicated by uh, co-chair uh, Connie. Uh, we, we'll be dealing with a follow-up discussion uh, continuing from yesterday on uh, Wawate Native Communications. So we are going in camera. There are some sensitive uh, issues, uh, sensitivities, uh, uh, they cannot necessarily be discussed publicly, uh, some important issues. So this is in camera and we will continue the same as yesterday. Uh, we are going to turn off the live feed. We're going to ask uh, everyone to please vacate the room unless uh, you are a chief, proxy, uh, NAN staff and the three councils. Uh, for this one we will not be having any observers. So no observers, let everybody else back in. Okay. Oh, you do want to speak? Okay. So uh, we are back. I'd like to welcome, can I get confirmation we're back online? We are back online. Welcome to those uh, watching online. Uh, we've uh, opened up the session again. So we have a request from the Women's Council. Can I have a chief uh, just endorse that support that make a request to re acknowledge the women's council can i have a chief do that please a good day ads from the women's council were you looking at me chief toledo yes okay okay so we'll have uh, the women's council uh, recognized go ahead hi good afternoon uh, chief fiddler and the deputy chiefs youth elders and delegates First off, um, I wanted to talk about, again briefly, just what I talked about yesterday regarding a valuable educational resource that we have an opportunity to, to um, publish, I guess we could say. Uh, I met with the, um, the author, the writer of this, uh, manuscript and he was here this morning actually and I'm not sure if he's still around but anyway he um, for the for the manuscript that's to be printed it's um, it's stories from our people the James Bay Coast and also all over Nan we have several elders that are in the book uh, for example, um, Sam Atanebaniskam, Wally McKay, Chris Kostajan from Piwanak, Edmitato Wapan, Louis Bird, Nola Kino, elder from Sandy Lake. There are a lot of elders that shared their stories, and this is a valuable tool in terms of providing education to our youth and to, to the future of students and knowledge keepers that will be, um, you know, that will be elders one day. And I know right now and in the past, we've always said that uh, 
our teachings are mostly oral history, but we know that the, a lot of the young people are losing their language and they don't understand the language and it's very important that uh, they have access to this resource. And what the um, Women's Council is asking is that uh, this be tabled for a resolution so that we can look at the, um, how we can proceed with this and add it maybe perhaps to the education department so that they can you know, work on publishing it. Um, that's my, uh, that was my, uh, my thought on this, and um, thank you for your time. Miigwech. Miigwech, thank you to the uh, Women's Council uh, representative uh, for that information. At this point, what we will do is uh, we'll go to resolutions on the agenda. We did have the Chief's Open Forum, uh, but we, it's very important to deal with the resolutions. We have like, nine resolutions, right? We have nine resolutions, a couple of things. Uh, the resolution on nuclear waste that was done in camera, there's a request uh, that uh, full transparency that that be read into the record and the people of Nishinaabeaski Nation will hear that. So we'll start by reading that resolution just so that people are aware of it. There was a resolution to be dealt with this morning as part of the Ganajihi uh, presentation. Now. There was to have been a presentation on some recommended changes. Uh, that presentation did not take place. So we'll come to that resolution. We'll read that resolution into the record, get the mover and seconder. As part of the discussion, we'll have the presentation. So I think that's how we'll do it within the resolution itself. And then there was another resolution from this morning, and then we'll continue on with uh, the resolution. So that's how we will proceed. Uh, welcome back to everybody coming into the room. So. Uh, can I have the resolution up on the screen, please? The resolution from this morning dealing with uh, nuclear waste uh, terms of reference, the uh, final approved uh, resolution. If I can have it uh, put up on the screen. So it was resolution uh, 2319, I believe. Okay, it's coming up. So, while they're putting it up on the screen, I will read the resolution. Uh, again, it's very important to have this uh, uh, done in public. Uh, resolution 2319, it's titled, The Approval of the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee on Nuclear Waste Terms of Reference. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the entire resolution. It reads, whereas, Nishinaabeaski Nation NAN Chiefs and Assembly passed Resolution 2213 NAN Opposition to the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's proposed deep, deep, deep geological repository to store nuclear waste near Ignace, Ontario, mandating the establishment of a Chiefs and Technical Action Committee, CTAC. Whereas Resolution 2213 mandates the NAN Executive to take action to prevent the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, NWMO, the Government of Canada, and the Government of Ontario from placing any nuclear waste in NAN traditional territories, including the formation of a Chiefs and Technical Action Committee. Whereas Resolution 2213 is part of a long tradition of resolutions by NAN Chiefs and Assembly, expressing opposition to nuclear waste within and near NAN territories. Resolution 9536, high-level nuclear waste concept. Resolution 9608, proposed nuclear fuel waste management and disposal concept hearings. Resolution 0557, nuclear waste-free zone. Resolution 0988, NWFZ and NWMO site selection. And Resolution 13, 37, Nuclear Waste Public Education. Whereas Article 29.2 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, 
provides that states must take effective measures to ensure that no storage or disposal of hazardous materials shall take place in the lands or territories of Indigenous peoples without their free prior and informed consent. And the declaration has been confirmed by the Federal United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Whereas Articles 3, Self-Determination, and 19, Free Prior and Informed Consent of UNDRIP also apply. Whereas the CTAC has been established along with the draft terms of reference, TOR. Whereas in order to undertake the important work of asserting and presenting credible risks associated with the NWMO proposed site location for a deep geological repository, DGR, near Ignace, Ontario, the TOR must receive approval. Whereas the TOR includes the following guiding principles, respect, honesty, transparency, good communication, courage, interconnectedness, unity, and empowerment. Whereas the purposes of the CTAC are to contribute to NAN's efforts, legal, political, and public media, to ensure NAN and citizens of NAN First Nations are empowered to fulfill their stewardship role over their traditional territories, in the context of potential storage of nuclear waste in a DGR in Ignace, Ontario. Contribute to NAN's efforts to protect in relation to NWMO's site selection process, the traditional territories of NAN First Nations, to ensure the continued ability of citizens of NAN First Nations to hunt, trap, fish, and otherwise use and care for their territories as their ancestors have done since time immemorial, now and seven generations forward. Support and ad advise the NAN staff working on the NWMO file and the NAN executive portfolio holder in executing mandates from the Chiefs and Assembly to ensure that the views and knowledge of NAN community members inform the actions being taken by NAN and NAN community members are aware of the DGR project, its implications for NAN citizens and steps being taken by NAN. Whereas the CTAC will be responsible for becoming informed about the DGR proposal and potential impacts for NAN and citizens of NAN First Nations, including through consultation with independent technical advisors and information from elders and knowledge keepers. Whereas the CTAC will help identify technical experts with relevant knowledge keepers and existing studies, assist with community engagement, and identify other relevant considerations for NAN in its negotiation and advocacy efforts. Whereas CTAC, whereas, sorry, the CTAC will need access to independent technical experts, knowledge keepers, and existing studies related to traditional land use and watersheds in compiling and communicating the risks to NAN territory associated with a proposed Ignace site location. Therefore, be it resolved that the NAN Chiefs and Assembly approve the Chiefs and Technical Action Committee CTAC terms of reference. Further, be it resolved that the CTAC shall compile all the identified information and bring it back to the First Nations for review and feedback in accordance with First Nation engagement and consent protocols. Further, be it resolved that the work of CTAC shall share and inform, or sorry, shall share and follow strict timelines based on First Nation protocols, legal and political options, and the NWMO process. Finally, be it resolved that the work of the CTAC shall be without prejudice to the existing and planned projects of NAN First Nations and Tribal Councils, dated at Thunder Bay, Ontario, this 17th day of August, 2023, moved by Chief Russell Wesley, Cat Lake First Nation, seconded by Chief Merle Loon, Meshkigogamang First Nation, and the resolution was carried. So that was the resolution that was dealt with in camera, uh, just to make sure that it is done in public. So next, we're gonna go to uh, the next resolution. And if I can have the next resolution uh, put up on screen, I'm not even sure which one. Ganaji, okay, is Ganaji here? here? Uh, okay, they are here. Very good. So the way we're going to do this is this was to have been part of the presentation this morning, but we will introduce the resolution, make sure we have a mover and seconder, and then as part of the discussion, we'll have a, a very brief presentation uh, just to explain it. Okay. 
So I don't have a hard copy in front of me. Can you just scroll to the top just so I can get the resolution number? So resolution 2320, it's titled Ganajihi Specialized Solvent Abuse Treatment Center Bylaw Amendments. Uh, I believe you have a copy. Thank you. As part of your kits, it should have been handed out, so I won't read the entire resolution. But it reads, uh, therefore be it resolved that the 2014 bylaw is rescinded and the bylaw attached to this resolution is passed and in force until further amended. Dated at, oh, very easy, that was a short resolution. Dated at Thunder Bay, the 17th day of August, 2023. Moved by proxy Verna Aganash. That might be a typo, unless she changed her name to Vern. <laughs> it's Verna Aganash. Uh, should be an A there. Uh, Kingfisher Lake First Nation, who is present. Uh, seconded by Chief Anne-Marie Beardy, Wawa Gabion First Nation, who is also present. So, uh, I'm going to ask the mover and seconder if they have any comments. And then after that, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, the team, if they can speak to uh, the resolution. Uh, mover, any comments? No? Seconder? No comments. Okay. Uh, mover, can I have, can I, I'm going to ask you to ask me to recognize uh, the uh, staff. Are you okay with? Who's staff? Yeah. <laughs> Just to have them recognized. Huh? One in, I don't know who's making the presentation. All, Ted, all, two of you? Okay. For the record, just to have them speak. Okay. All right. Miigwech. Uh, so we're going to recognize the team from uh, Kanaji. Oh. Do you want to start? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the time to speak with you. Um, our lawyer, Ted Scully, will present on the changes to the bylaw that we would like to uh, be considered by um, the Chiefs and Council here. Miigwech. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in the package you have, you have the resolution that Adam had started, to, the chair had started to read out. And also in the package you have a, a draft of the new resolution. So what brought this about was that uh, when the bylaws were done years and years ago, um, <coughs> for Kanachihi, it was um, provided that the membership of Kanachihi was actually the 49 NAN chiefs. And um, even though that's what it said and it hasn't been updated for uh, many, many years, Kanachi has not really been operating like that for a lot of uh, logistic regions, uh, reasons. Um, you know, budgetary constraints and whatnot in running their program, it's not feasible to have um, uh, an AGM with 49 chiefs attending, uh, for one thing, is a monetary reason. But they have been operating basically by having a representative from each of the tribal councils that are involved, which are part of the resolution. And those ones are essentially, um, actually I can't read with my glasses on here, so hold on. We've got, um, where is it here? I'm just going to pull out the resolution itself, but I'm looking for it in the package. Do you have the resolution? Adam, do you have it? There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. No. Okay, no, that's the nuclear waste one. That's okay. So the resolution itself was uh, was indicating that uh, Kanachahi was actually in, organized uh, in 1998, and um, it was updated in 2014 because there were changes in the Canada not-for-profit corporations legislation. Um, <coughs> but under that bylaw, the actual members of Kanachi, as I said, are the 49 Nishnabiaski chiefs, but that's not how Kanachi has been operating. So what we have done is actually indicate, um, and the board has passed this updated resolution to update the governance structure so it's more current. And um, again, so there's a, there's a director from each of the Metal First Nations Management, Kiwait Nikoka Mechanic, Shibugama First Nations Council, Windigo First Nations Council, uh, IFNA, Bashkigawak, Waboon, and then the following group of in, uh, independent First Nations, which is Hornpain, Mishkigaming, Ojibwe Nation, uh, Mokribek Council of the Cree Nation, Sandy Lake First Nation, Wagashig First Nation, and Winusk First Nation. So 
what the bylaw has, and the only change in the bylaw that you'll see that's of note is that now the membership membership consists of those tribal councils, as well as the group of independent nations that were identified, and each of those groups will appoint a director, and then when it comes time for the AGM. Um, there'll be a representative from each of the tribal councils and the independent First Nations as a group. And that will be, um, those people will be at the AGM and will pass the financial statements and update the directorship and that type of thing. So that's the um, amendment that the board is recommending to the chiefs for Kanachi He's governance structure. Uh, maybe I'll stop there. Are there any questions about that? Any questions? And uh, nothing online as well. Okay. Good. Oh, there is a question, Chief, Chief Allen. Yeah. Is it just on the bylaw itself, or the building, or the buildings built in the city limits? We just had a long discussion here, and I'm just <laughs> checking to see if these assets that are built in the city limits of Sulakot and Timmins mm -hmm. are going to be protected by NAN and not taken away or put for foreclosure or, or any of that kind of stuff so that you know that's why we had this AGM here and then we were talking about many things yeah and then some of these treatment centers should be you know we always talk about having these programs on the land and mm -hmm. maybe within our first nation I don't know if these buildings are built right now so this is that's why I'm saying is this about the bylaw itself or the structures this is only about the governance structure, Chief. Okay. So the buildings are completely separate. Okay. Any further questions? No, and nothing online, so we can keep going. Okay, well. More or? That's it. <laughs> no, that's all that our presentation is. So, um, and like I said, it's really updating the governance structure to be current as it as it is being followed. Thank you. So, no other questions on the resolution before you. I don't see any. So, with that, I'm going to call for question. Uh, all in favor of the resolution, uh, raise your hand, please. All in favor. Thank you. Uh, any opposition? Oh, I forgot to check online. Any opposition? I see none online, none in the room. Any abstentions? I see none. So with that, uh, resolution is carried. So thank you, Miigach. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Connie for the next resolution, and I think that's the, uh, the inquest resolution from this morning. Uh, the late... Uh, Moses Beaver uh, resolution. Before we go to Connie, uh, Proxy Matthew Angies. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question about uh, the treatment centers. Just an operational question. Okay, so there is, uh, we're dealing with the resolutions now. I know there was an opportunity this morning for uh, discussion. Uh, We've moved on to the next resolution, so I'm going to sort of suggest if you can have the discussion on the side. Okay, Migach, uh, Kaini. You're going to have to go right to the top. So we have to announce the number of the resolution and the title. Okay. 2321, titled Implementation of the Moses Beaver Inquest Recommendations. Now you can go down to the therefore be it resolved. Therefore be it resolved that the NAN Chiefs and Assembly fully endorse and support the recommendations of the Moses Beaver Inquest. Further, it be it resolved that the Chiefs and Assembly formally 
express their appreciation for the tireless work of the jury during the proceedings and direct NAN Executive Council to communicate this resolution to the jury through the office of the Chief Coroner. Further, be it resolved that the Chiefs in Assembly direct the NAN Executive Council to work with identified organization to implement the recommendations. Further, be it resolved that the Chiefs in Assembly call upon the Government of Canada and Ontario to fulfill their moral and legal obligation to provide the required resources to all identified organizations and stakeholders with the vested interest to engage in the implementation activities. Further, be it resolved that the Chiefs in Assembly direct the NAN Executive Council to take all reasonable steps to advocate for the implementation of all recommendations to provide regular updates on the implementation of the recommendations to NAN Chiefs. Finally, be it resolved that the implementation of this resolution shall be without prejudice to existing and future projects, initiatives, processes, or proposals at the First Nation and Tribal Council levels. And the resolution shall not interfere with individuals, individual First Nations access to funding. Dated at Thunder Bay, the 17th day of August, 2023. I need a mover for this resolution. I need a mover. I don't see it. We didn't get the updated. Okay. So Chief Crane was the is the mover for the resolution. Does uh, Chief Crane have any comments? Yeah. It's not even on this one. Do you have any comments? Good afternoon. I support the, the resolution. I have a, a lot of uh, compassion for our, our, um, our young people, our people. And uh, <clears throat> it's heartbreaking when we, when we lose our, um, our people, our people in the, in the system. Sometimes we think we're protecting somebody. Sometimes we're forced to have somebody removed. And these people have, have problems. They have uh, mental issues. They have addiction problems. They have the history, there's a history, and there's, and there's things that drive our people to be where they're at. And sometimes these people don't make it, they don't survive. So I, I, <clears throat> I get pretty emotional when I talk about stuff like this, because I've lost family members where there was, where we were left behind to think what could we have done, what could have been done. I just, um, I, I, um, I will stand with this, uh, with this resolution. Miigwech. Miigwech, Chief Crane, Chief Toledo. Does the seconder have any comments? Hello. Um, you know, it's sad that, um, you know, at times that's the outcome when our uh, people go into the system due to the fact of whatever their issues may have been, addictions or mental health. Now it's very sad that uh, 
in this case that the, the, the outcome of what the resolution says and I, I second this and uh, and uh, you know the resolution uh, pretty well speaks for itself Miigrets. Thank you chiefs for your comments. So the floor is now open for any additional comments on this resolution. Chief Wesley. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, uh, over a certain period of time, I've seen a number of these resolutions. And uh, the, the issue with them is the fact that we, uh, we have to encourage uh, uh, the enforcement and uh, implementation of these recommendations. It seems to me that there's a there's a process that's lacking in, in with this whole situation. And um, at one point, I had discussions with uh, uh, Dirk Heyer as to how that process of Im implementing the recommendations uh, could be undertaken. And that's a process that we need to, to investigate, uh, research, and uh, look at as to how and what the body would look like that would enforce these things. There has to be a, a way or a mechanism to enforce these uh, numerous uh, inquest recommendations that uh, we've undertaken over the last, uh, uh, I would say, 20 years. Um, I know in my community's case, the uh, Romeo Wesley inquest, uh, uh, I would venture to say that uh, maybe two recommendations out of the 45 have been implemented. And um, I, I, I don't know, I don't have anything that I would suggest in terms of the body or how it could be formalized or how that would occur, but that's certainly something that that um, uh, Grand Chief should, should, should look at. And, you know, we all know that a lot of the recommendations uh, include the particular issues of that inquest. Uh, just to, to cite an example in the Romeo Wesley inquest, there's a need for the recognition of delirium. Uh, you know, that means certain policy shifts in the organizations as to how to accommodate and learn about these uh, issues like delirium. You know, but how do you enforce those? There, there has to be a body, and we have to have it created somehow uh, as a means of uh, implementing these recommendations. And that's the issue I have with this. There's nothing wrong with this. I support it, but that's something that's missing in, in these things that uh, we, you know we're trying to ask the governments to uh, to uh, to deal with. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, Grand Chief is going to respond. Miigwech, uh, Chief uh, Wesley, for your your comment and expressing your concern. Yeah, you're right. Uh, these recommendations, including the Mos Moses Beaver inquest, and this in this case, the 63 recommendations that float from that inquest are not legally binding. that no party is required by law to comply. But I think in the cases like Moses Beaver, you know, and if you go back to the seven year think past, that there are some cases that are so compelling that it should move all of us to take appropriate action to see that they are fully implemented. We saw that with a seven youth inquest where Nishtab Basque Nation took leadership and held everyone accountable, including ourselves, because the, the responsibility comes back to us that in order for us to honor the, the memory of, in this case, Moses Beaver, that we need to honor his memory and his family, and I think what should also be remembered is that a few days after Moses Beaver died here in Thunder Bay that his family left 
the community on Owens Road, you know, on their way here, they had a, an accident. It was an automobile accident, and his sister died in that accident. And then a few days later, there was a double funeral, and the epidemic was his beaver and his sister. And so I think it's important for us to do the work that is necessary to uh, ensure that these recommendations are fully implemented so we will convene. And I think that's the uh, the intent of this resolution that uh, Deputy Grand Chief Anabedi has, has uh, convened and the resolution calls for for us to do this. That we need to hold not just Ontario and Canada uh, accountable but also the, the jails. Uh, there's certain parties that are uh, subject to these recommendations, uh, including NAPS, including our own police service, including the other police services, including the, the mental health service agencies across the region, that we need to bring all these parties together so that we can see, uh, we can develop a plan that will see uh, the full implementation of these, of these uh, six to three recommendations. So the, uh, I don't know if you want to go through this, Dan Benny. You can just mention that because you used to recommend that you. So the uh, just for the record, um, the sixty-third recommendation uh, is directed to the office of the chief coroner for Ontario, and it reads: the office of the chief coroner shall should conduct an annual review of recommendations from past Ontario inquests dealing with mental health, dealing with mental illness and addiction issues experienced by First Nations persons. This exam examination should take place to determine whether such recommendations have been implemented and to identify any patterns in the implementation of recommendations and common obstacles and the non-implementation of recommendations. The results should be reviewed with political territorial organizations, such as NAN, to evaluate the ongoing need. So part of the, this work will include a review of previous um, inquests, including the one you referenced earlier from your community, that we need to go back and look at uh, any outstanding work from these recommendations. So that will be part of this work uh, that this resolution calls for. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. But I just want to encourage uh, the, you know, the executive that we have to be really vocal and there has to be strong advocacy to put something in place, something in place, because we have numerous inquests probably in at least a couple hundred recommendations. And I, I actually, I don't know what the status of those recommendations are. I can only cite my, my inquest. But that's the other thing, is uh, we need to know what the status of those recommendations are because each one of these uh, inquests affect, the, affect us. They, they affect us all. And we need to have some kind of uh, accountability measure in place to ensure that they're, they're being implemented. So I think what we can commit to you and to the chiefs and assemblies that as part of the work that will result from this resolution is that we need to go back and we need to come back to you and report on all the outstanding uh, recommendations and, and rec uh, from previous from previous inquests. I think we need to uh, give you a, a report card and uh, what's outstanding. And again, for us to advocate to all the appropriate parties that they also need to put together a, a plan uh, for them to uh, implement those recommendations. And, and a lot of times that means money. That means funding, committing funding and appropriate resources to a recommendation. So we will uh, endeavor, we will make sure that that happens, that uh, at a future assembly we will come back. We will come back and give you a full reporting 
of all those uh, outstanding rec uh, outstanding inquests, including um, the Romeo Wesley inquest with Catholic, that we we need to make sure, uh, as I said, as a way of honoring those that we lost and the, the, those that are subject to these inquests and their families, that we do this. Thank you, Chief, for your comments, and thank you, um, Grand Chief, for your commitment to do that work to um, address the Chief's concerns. So the floor is still open on this resolution. The floor is still open for any additional comments. I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to ask for a vote. All those in favor of this resolution, 2321. Please raise your hands. Okay, so we do have 23, and 23 is the quorum we needed. So, online. Okay. Any abstentions? Any abstentions to this resolution? I see none. Any opposition? I see none. Thank you. Okay, next one. Adam asked earlier, can I see the screen to read the resolution? Because I, I was reading from the hard copy and there was no movers. But I don't know that I can see that far. <laughs> I believe the next one is uh, reaffirmation of charter of relationship. Okay. I'm assuming 23 slash 22. Okay. All right. 23 slash 22 is the reaffirmation of Charter of Relationship Principles Governing Health System Transformation in Nan Territory. So go down to the therefore be it resolved. Okay. Therefore be it resolved that the Nan Chiefs and Assembly reaffirm commitment for the Charter of Relationship principles governing health system transformation in NAN territory and support NAN's continued work to coordinate the health transformation project with NAN First Nations and all tribal council and health authority partners. Further be it resolved that the health transformation project will continue to be driven by voices at the grassroots level, including NAN First Nations community members, community workers, elders and youth. Further be it resolved that NAN will continue to focus on strengthening partnerships and aligning the efforts of all partners working collaboratively towards health transformation, including NAN Health Transformation, Tribal Councils, First Nations Health Authorities, Co-op, and provincial and federal governments. Finally, be it resolved that NAN will bring together decision, make, decision makers, including the NAN Chiefs Council on Health Transformation, NAN Chiefs to provide key updates and seek further direction as the work of health transformation evolves through the collective efforts of all partners. Dated at Thunder Bay, Ontario, the 17th day of August, 2023, moved by Chief George Kakagamic. And where is Chief George? Okay. As the day goes on, I'm getting blinder and blinder. And Chief Lorraine Crane, so both the mover and seconder in the room, does the mover have any comments? Hi. 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 Good afternoon. Um, I just want to thank um, Deputy Chief Lankleader uh, for the work that he has done so far, along with uh, Alvin Fiddler. Uh, as we know, <clears throat> we just went through a, a pandemic, and uh, we have, most of our communities experienced some uh, lack of health, health services in our community. So we need a lot of work uh, done to, to be able to uh, help our, our people in our community. So once again, miigwech to the Deputy Chief. Thank you, Chief, for those comments. Does the move seconder have any comments? Oops. 
Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, again. I think we, uh, we all know in our communities how, uh, how poor our, the, the system is for, um, for the, for the health care that our people get in regards to, especially in uh, NIHB. I had a, an example there. <laughs> I think every week some of, somebody has an example of what, the, what our people go through. And, and we can't do anything about it. Um, we'd like to, as leaders. But uh, an example is uh, somebody on their way home from here got sick and so look out, went to emerge, and uh, was told he can't go home um, because of her health and uh, um, her health. But she had a she had to go on IV right away with uh, an extensive treatment. Had a little family with her, and they wouldn't put her up. And what they told, what non-insured said was, uh, you, need a, you need a detailed letter from the doctor. I was very upsetting to the herself, the patient, this is what happens. And I don't know, I, uh, I, I shouldn't say I don't know. That's why we have much work to do uh, as a team. But I'm also looking at uh, NAN. We have to do more. You know how stressful it is for somebody to be sick and then you're told, we can't, you, we can't, you cannot be, you cannot uh, be accommodated because you don't have a doctor's letter. The, the, those kind of things, you know, like, um, and, uh, and when somebody is sick, it just adds, the stress doesn't help when somebody is not feeling well. I don't know how many stories we can all share daily to know that when this is what happens to our people. So I'm 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 proud to be on the, I'm I'm glad to be on this t on that team with George and uh, the other chiefs. Um, we sit on the work group for this uh, health transformation, but I. I don't know, I think you guys get sick of listening, listening to me. I sound like a, I keep repeating what I say, and I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to stop saying it because it's true. This is what's happening to our people. Yeah. Thank you, Chiefs, for your comments. So the floor is now open for any additional comments on this resolution. Any other comments? Second call, okay. Matthew, and then we'll go to uh, Chief Benson. I guess uh, from day one, from the time that uh, the tribal council was gotten, but I'm still not clear on what the intent is and also how all the partners are going to work together to to deal with the uh, the issues that the chief is talking about. I know there's a lot of issues, and I know that Slifn is kind of doing their own thing too, and also the other tribal council are doing their own thing. And I'm not sure what the plan is in terms of moving forward, uh, because there has to be changes in terms of. Uh, 
how the health services are delivered. But we seem to be just going around, going around in circles, depending on the funding availability. So I don't know where it's at in terms of, does this mean that the funding given below for this year is, is this after 2024, is that, is that it? Or I haven't seen any reports in terms of the meetings. I have seen the minutes, but I, I thought there was going to be some kind of uh, a strategic uh, framework in terms of how each partners are going to work together collectively to to address the, uh, the issues that we face today. I, I, I just have this question. Okay. Thank you, Proxy. Uh, Matthew Angies, I'm going to defer that to um, Deputy Chief um, Linklater. Thank you for the question, uh, Matthew. Um, this is a process that we were supposed to develop a system design throughout NAN territory. Uh, NAN is not a service delivery person, uh, so the collaboration between uh, all the health partners within our territory is, is so important. Uh, to some of the issues that we deal with on a daily basis, uh, for us to make real change and address the inequities of health, um, there is, it was a five-year cycle, so the funding is ending at the end of uh, March 2024. Uh, we have a lot of work to do as we work with all our service providers, our First Nations, our uh, health authorities, our tribal councils, to develop a entity that will basically take control of health services in our area. We do got to get a buy-in regionally. Uh, we did have a presentation on Monday from uh, Grand Chief uh, Doug Kelly, how they went through the process. It took them 12 years. Our struggle was when we started this process, we were hit with a global pandemic. And as bad as it, as it was, we saw the federal government, the provincial government, public health, uh, um, health authorities, hospitals, everyone working together, all the bureaucratic red tape dropped to actually deal with the crisis. As soon as we came out of COVID, all that red tape came back up. And uh, what we were trying to negotiate with our partners, and those talks have been going on with the province. It's been a busy summer with uh, the provincial uh, government, the federal government, uh, is to, to really get move it forward. Um, so it's to develop an entity so they could just give that health services to that entity and the tough work is how is everyone going to work together and it is going to be a process uh, there's going to be a lot of meetings coming within this next year there is a time crunch but just because it says it's over it doesn't mean the door is closed if we have a good work plan a good framework to present not only to our partners on the ground throughout NAN but to governments um, there is possibility for extension for funding but it is a process and uh, day one presentation, it talked about the issues, the political issues that 203 First Nations had to deal with at, at the, at, in BC. And, you know, we're 48. <laughs> I can't imagine 203, but you know what, we have a lot of work to do. And it's, it's how, once we get a hold of it and we develop an entity, we come back to the Chiefs. Um, then is the big thing is how do we implement how do we change how do we improve the lives of our people when it comes to uh, medical services and nihb and all that other stuff how do we build something that's uh not less than but something that meets the true needs of our people so hopefully that answers your question You're smiling, so I'm assuming that you're, that answers your question. All right, Chief Benson. Okay, hello, uh, bonjour. Okay, can you give us a wish to Ann? Can you do a good job, Chief Lorraine? Crane, I just want to bring this up now. I'm not exactly sure when. 
when I bought this up, but I decided to do it now since I heard uh, Lorraine talk on this matter, on this issue. It's regarding the, uh, uh, the medical travel that we encounter almost every day, I guess, through, uh, through, uh, Wick through uh, Wickedong, where, uh, where the patients, the uh, discharged patients, or stranded. Yeah, guy, he got a bit of from Thunder Bay. And they, uh, and it just said that uh, because there's no seats available on the airlines that we're using. North Star. And I, uh, and I, I find it very hard to, uh, to believe that the, uh, that there's no seats available on the airlines. Because I talked to the airlines, the airlines themselves, they said that they, uh, that there's they, uh, it rotates every 12, 24 hours. There's always seats available. What I'm getting at is um, the first time I got here a couple of days ago, there was an out, a discharged patient with a, a mother and a daughter. And they were told that the seats are booked until seven days time and that's unbelievable i don't know if i would believe that so i asked i just worked on it and uh and it so happened that uh the, the patients that were supposed to be stuck here seven days they went that afternoon after i contact the airline and then another patient yesterday was told to go, he won't be going home until Sunday. So I, again, I worked on it and uh, uh, this patient went home this morning. So I don't know where the problem is. I think it's at the, uh, the uh, where the travel, where they do the travel arrangements at the uh, Wekadong Lodge. I think they just called there one time and that's it. They don't keep trying. And that has been an ongoing problem. We have patients being stuck. And, and then uh, sometimes those patients get in trouble. You know, so we, have, we, have, we have to help them out. So that's a similar problem with Sulakot travel, medical travel. So I just want to bring this up uh, while I have a chance to do this. I don't know exactly where, when I could have bought it, but I'm, I'm glad I'm given a time to, uh, to bring this up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, in my former life, I was actually, uh, I, work, I did non-insured health benefit travel for patients. It's a little different in, in the Northwest, and I find it very strange because in our region uh, we have a charter system uh, prior approval process that you know from the moment you get your appointment um, it's, there's a two-week window or 10 week uh, a 10-day window we call it two weeks everything is set up from accommodation travel um, they work in collaboration uh, in the east they do it through waha who, who does that service so they know beforehand there is a mechanism in place for emergency travel medevacs, and, and it's not perfect, but you know what, for some of the stories we've been hearing on this side, uh, NAN is not a service delivery, but you know what, we could advocate just on those fronts because you know what, there is a better way. Uh, it's a little easier to do in the James Bay with the, uh, you know, the communities, um, but you know what, there is always an innovative way to get things done because you, who, who does it affect the most? It affects our patients who are already battling with sickness, the stress, the families, you know. 
Um, it does contribute to social issues. So I feel you uh, about accommodations. I mean, there is a resolution coming where it looks like Wekadon is looking for an expansion for uh, their accommodations. So, you know, if it is a question of need, um, I think um, as an organization, from what I look at the resolution, that they are trying to address that need. Um, but I think every, every chief here could probably tell you a story about NIHB and what it brings because if they don't, uh, when someone gets stranded or something happens, who do they call? They, they'll call you, right? And uh, so, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, a lot of these concerns are documented through our process. And, you know, uh, we could work with our partners to help find solutions and, and address it. Thank you. Thank you, Chiefs, for bringing those, um, those issues you deal with uh, for the executive to hear and to see that the urgency of um, getting this um, health transformation going is how important it is. So the floor is still open to, um, to hear any other comments on this resolution. 22, 23, 22. So I don't see any other comments. Ask for a vote on this resolution. We have a quorum. Check on the quorum issue. So all in favor of this resolution? All in favor? Please raise your hands. Online. We have quorum. Yep. Okay, we have quorum. Any opposition? I don't see any. Any abstentions? I don't see any uh, resolutions. Oh. Okay. Do you want your abstention um, noted? Um, just, uh, just uh, as a matter of record, I guess uh, <clears throat> there's still a lot of work that needs to be done at the community level in terms of engagement and all that. So uh, at this time, I think I'll just abstain from this resolution for the time being, uh, given the not to not to uh, not to uh, um, put down the work that's been done to date, but obviously that work that has that has been translated so far, uh, I think it needs to needs to go back to the community as well. So, so I know there's references of uh, decision makers, grassroots levels here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'll just abstain for on record for now. But uh, hopefully, the, the leadership will be able to determine how to proceed after. But not, we're not objecting to it. But it's just a matter okay. of. Uh, so your abstention is noted and recorded. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, chiefs. Resolutions are coming up. Do you want to give it a try? We'll help you. But then I'm a professional. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to turn it over to our youth uh, co-chair, Kyra. Uh, Chiefs, just to let you know, we have, uh, what is it, five more? Six more resolutions. Uh, we're, uh, we do have quorum. But if uh, potentially two more walk out, we're going to lose quorum. So uh, somebody lock the door. <laughs> I know uh, important things come up. If you absolutely have to go, please let us know. We're trying to make sure we get through all the resolutions, six more. So we should be able to get through it uh, fairly quickly. So I'll turn it over to Kyra. Can we actually pull up the recognition of NAN athletes who participated at the 2023 North American Indigenous Games? Are we in quorum? Are we good? We're in quorum, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, uh, 20, 20, 23, 23. No. Recognition of non athletes who participated at the 2023 North American Indigenous Games. Um, therefore, be it resolved that the NAN chiefs in Chiefs in Assembly direct the NAN Executive Council to set up a forum or event so that the athletes who participated at the 2023 NAG can be recognized in the hope of inspiring others to step up and make a difference in their communities. Dated at uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, this 17th day of August, 2023. Um, we do have a mover. Um, oh. oh, he's not here. Oh, okay. Uh, can I have a mover? Okay. Chief Mama Kizuk of uh, Deer Lake. Thank you. Uh, can I also have a second seconder? Uh, Chief Chief Loon. Mishkigomago. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, oh, Chief Mama Kizuk, do you have uh, anything to say? Hey, no, I encourage um, First Nations participation all the time. Even um, at home, I, we set up funds for anybody that can make it to the North American Indigenous Games. And I'm always um, up for hockey as well. So anything to do with youth, I'm always for it. Thank you, Chief. Um, Chief Loon, do you have anything to say? No, you're good. Okay. Um, uh, the floor is open for discussion or any comments. Uh, yeah, one. Okay, good. Um, I'd just like to also uh, take this opportunity as a Deputy Grand Chief to really acknowledge all of our athletes throughout uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation who uh, did uh, find their own capacity uh, to go to uh, NAG. I know this is one area that uh, we'd like to really uh, foster and, and support at the community level. Uh, we know that uh, there's many athletes uh, that that couldn't even try out or have an opportunity uh, to represent their nation due to uh, access or where the tryouts were. Uh, so uh, we understand that due to many of our communities' uh, uh, financial positions or support for these initiatives, uh, at times may be lacking. And uh, all due respect uh, to the organizers of Team Ontario, but uh, I think uh, I'd like to really acknowledge uh, the, the youth athletes across NAN and also the NAN, uh, the leadership in the communities for supporting our NAN uh, youth ath athletes. And I think it's very imperative that we, uh, as we move ahead, uh, that we find supports and build capacity at the community level to support our children, youth, uh, uh, athletes as well, uh, and uh, have capacity at the community level uh, so they could engage in positive recreation sports activities and have them an opportunity to also showcase uh, their athletic abilities and other future uh, sporting events as well. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge other past uh, uh, NAN-wide initiatives such as uh, the Little Bands and uh, uh, Mishkegwuk uh, Cup there where they did have like uh, youth uh, uh, sports initiatives there as well so, and we continue to uh, advocate for more resources to, uh, to go to the community level to support uh, our, our First Nations athletes. So, miigwech. Thank you, Deputy Grand Chief. Um, I don't see any hands up. Oh, uh, call, I will call for question. I'm just going to help out here. A uh, question has been called, but I just want to make sure I know there's some chiefs out, just outside the door, and we need them. Just to make sure we can, uh, so we need one more. Gary, <laughs> uh, we do need one more, and I know uh, 
There are some chiefs out in the hall. Get busy. Just to make sure. Uh, can you just take a look to see if there's any chiefs standing right there? Yeah. I know some have gone out for some discussions or some fresh air. I just want to make sure we're good. And we dragged Gary back in. <laughs> I think Mike found somebody. As soon as we can see them, we're, we're good. Okay. Oh. Okay, um, all in favor of this resolution, and raise your hand. Thank you. Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, resolution is carried, thank you. Uh, the one I have here is the support for the full impl implementation of this truth and reconciliation of commission's calls to action within uh, Nishinaabe ASCII Nation. Uh, 23, 24, support for the full impl implementation of the truth and reconcilia reconciliation of commission's call to action within Anishinaabe ASCII Nation. Um, dated at Thunder Bay, Ontario, this 17th day of August, 2023. Um, therefore, be it resolved that NAN chiefs in assembly continue to support and adopt the 94 calls to action as a level of government in order to address the ongoing and systemic issues regarding NAN First Nations. Okay. Uh, further, be it resolved that the that the that chiefs in assembly mandate the NAN Executive Council to call on the Government of Canada to further commit to the implementation of the 94 calls to action with a focus on for First Nation consultation. Further be it resolved that the Chiefs in Assembly call on the Government of Canada to create and implement a national strategy to address the 94 calls to action with deadlines in place and specific goals made available to the public in collaboration with First Nations. Further be it resolved that the NAN Executive Council is mandated to advocate with the provincial and federal governments and develop other partnerships for the resources required to fulfill the 94 calls to action within NAN territory. <coughs> Finally, be it resolved that the implementation of the resolution shall be without uh, um, prejudice. <laughs> to existing and future pro uh, projects, initiatives, and process or proposals at the NAN First Nation and Tribal Council levels. In addition, the resolution shall not, shall not interfere with individual First Nation communities' access to funding. Um, so we have a mover. Uh, oh, is the... Okay, uh, can I have a mover, please? Need a mover. There is uh, the reason why we have asked for this resolution. Uh, is that um, the government uh, has been uh, um, 
quite slow in terms of uh, the implementation. And, um, and even with uh, some of the committees that they have uh, put together, they have excluded um, uh, survivors. And, and we feel it is um, quite uh, important that we um, have more of a accountability process when it comes to the federal government because they are the ones responsible for uh, the imp implementation of the 90 call, uh, 94 calls to justice. We are, uh, it is noted that, um, that um, the TRC was, uh, um, the report was in 2015. It is now um, 2023 and there's been very slow progress. And with the recent, uh, um, um, I guess, levels of our survivors coming out, um, you know, developing initiatives, it is very important that we support them. And, uh, and I ask that, uh, that if we could have a, a mover and a, and a seconder and support for this resolution, uh, we would be very grateful. <coughs> Mingwich. Thank you, Deputy Grand Chief. Wesley. Uh, Chief Wesley, do you move? Okay, thank you. And then seconder proxy Gray Owen? Yeah. Oh, he's here, okay. Um, Chief Wesley is moving. Um, do you have anything to say, Chief, Chief Wesley? have a lot to say no I just want to point out why something like this is important um, just a few few minutes ago there's a email on uh, bill 71 uh, it's the uh, Mining Act amendments and there's a <clears throat> There's a disclaimer on there that has to do with the Minister of Mines. And, uh, you know, that's concerning. That's really concerning. One of the issues that we've always had, particularly in the mining uh, sector, is the ability for the Minister to, uh, to uh, permit a mine. But one of the calls to action in UNDRIP is, uh, and uh, TRC, recommendations is on mining so that's why I'm moving this just so everybody knows thank you chief Wesley um, proxy gray Owen do you have anything to say uh, no comment okay thank you um, the floor is now open for discussions The floor is now open for discussion. This is the final call. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm going to call for question. Um, all in favor? Miigwech. Um, any opposed? Uh, any abstentions? Mm -hmm. uh, resolution is carried. Thank you. Very good. Okay, Miigwech. Thank you, uh, Kyra. I think we have, what, three more? I lost track. Three more? Resolution? Four more. Okay. Uh, we do have quorum. Uh, if we lose one more, that's, uh, we lose quorum. So we'll try and go fairly quickly. Not to rush, but uh, we'll try and get through all the resolutions. Uh, I'm not sure which one. I'll just watch. Okay, Nan Hope. Uh, resolution, I'm just going to read on the screen. If you can zoom in just to help me out. Uh, resolution 2325. 
Uh, it's titled Support for Nan Hope's Mental Health and Addiction Support Access Program and in Community Response Team. Uh, down to, therefore, be it resolved that NAN Chiefs and Assembly support the request by Kiwetnik Ogumakanak Northern Chiefs Tribal Council to ISC for sustainable funding for the NAN Hope Virtual and in and in community surge services beyond September 23, September 2023 and March 2024 for an ongoing extended period of three years or more until the services are no longer required by NAN First Nations. Further be it resolved that the NAN Executive Council is mandated to include NAN Hope virtual and in community services in its health transformation planning and negotiations to secure funding from Canada and Ontario to fill mental health and substance use gaps in NAN First Nation communities. Finally, be it resolved that this resolution is initiated by Giwed Nagogumakanag Northern Chiefs Tribal Council, which, uh, is that a typo? Which has, have, uh, so it reads, which has the technology and infrastructure to develop the services and infrastructure to deliver the services and is not intended to compete for funding for individual First Nations, tribal councils, or health authorities in NAN territory. Dated at Thunder Bay, Ontario, this 17th day of August, 2023. I uh, don't have a mover on the screen. Do I have a mover? No? Uh, so can I have a mover? Uh, Chief Kakagamak, uh, Kiwewin, uh, moves. Do I have a seconder? Do I have a seconder to the resolution? I do have a mover. I uh, require a seconder. This resolution. Uh, proxy, uh, two hands. Uh, I'll take uh, Chief uh, Lefty Cam, uh, Bearskin Lake. So the resolution is before you. Uh, Chief Kahigamak, do you want to speak to the resolution? I'll just make a comment. <clears throat> uh, I guess you know uh, none of our communities are immune to crisis, and uh, I've always stressed to my uh, people in my community, there are services out there. If you're if you're having any difficulties in life, there are services out there that you can reach out to, and this is one of the examples that uh, that are out there uh, for our people to to be able to reach out and uh, if they need help, there are services out there that they can reach to. Miigwech. Thank you, Miigwech. Uh, Chief Cam, any comments? Uh, no comment. Okay, Miigwech. Uh, floor is open. Uh, if there's any discussion or comments on the resolution before you. Uh, online as well. I don't see anything online. I don't see any hands up. Uh, second call in the room. Uh, final call, is there any uh, comments, questions, or discussion on the resolution? If not, uh, I'm going to call for question. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, any opposition? Uh, I see no opposition. Any abstentions? I see none online, nothing online. So with that, resolution is carried, so thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next resolution. I'll just wait on the screen. Once we have it up on the screen, we'll go through the uh, title and the resolution number. So it's uh, number 2326, titled Controlled Drugs and Substances Act Enforcement. And it reads, uh, we'll go down to the bottom, It reads, therefore be it resolved that the NAN Chiefs and Assembly strongly support the recommendations of uh, COO that the enforcement of First Nation bylaws be included as a mandatory police function in the regulation for adequate and effective policing under the CSPA. 
Further be it resolved that the NAN Executive Council is mandated to immediately begin negotiation with the Ontario Ministry of the Solicitor General to ensure that the First Nation bylaw enforcement be included as a mandatory police function in the regulation for adequate and effective policing under the CPSA before September 1st, 2023, deadline for comments on the draft regulation. Finally, be it resolved that the NAN Executive Council shall continue to advocate and negotiate for A, adequate funding and training for First Nations security personnel, B, redesign of First Nation airport facilities to provide room for security screening, C, adequate funding for security screening equipment, and uh, scroll left a bit, yeah, D, enhanced enforcement of the CDSA in conjunction with the enforcement of community bylaws in remote First Nation communities. Dated at Thunder Bay, Ontario, this 17th day of August, 2023, moved by Chief Russell Wesley, who is present, uh, seconded by Chief Lefty Kamenowaterman, who is also present. Uh, mover, Chief Wesley, do you want to speak to the resolution? Um, yeah, um, and, well, I'm sure everybody's heard uh, the, the story on bylaws in, uh, in our community, especially the remote First Nations that are flying Winter Road accessible, and, um, and, and the issues around uh, enforcement and bylaws that has to do with alcohol and drugs, and, and there's you know, been ongoing problems with our policing and with respect to enforcing community bylaws. So that's what this resolution is all about. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. The uh, resolution is self-explanatory. Miigwech. Miigwech, thank you. Uh, Chief Kamenow Uh Good afternoon. Okay, uh, <clears throat> with this uh, resolution, uh, and our community, as any other community, um, uh, I'm sure you, everybody's aware that uh, drugs are really uh, on the rise. It's very concerning. And uh, in our fight against it, uh, uh, <clears throat> I guess, I don't know if I guess I'll, I'm just putting, uh, punching the air, or, but uh, we need proper resources. Like, for example, uh, airport and winter road uh, security systems uh, uh, <clears throat> it's a liability issue, like our security dudes that put themselves uh, at risk here, uh, uh, they're not properly trained, and uh, they, we, don't, we don't have the proper equipment or even a building to accommodate, uh, you know, to do their uh, jobs uh, at, the, at their workplaces, uh, at airport and winter road checkpoints. So. Uh, so, uh, so with those uh, things, uh, uh, a lot of drugs tend to come through in, uh, into our into my community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Miigwech, uh, The floor is open. If there's any discussion on uh, the resolution before you? It's been we cannot demanue doesn't Nothing online. I don't see anybody uh, in the room. Uh, last call. Do you wish to speak to the resolution? If not, I'm going to go ahead and call a question. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand, please. Thank you. Uh, any opposition? I see none. Nothing online. Any abstentions? I see none. So with that, resolution is carried. Thank you. We'll move right along to the next resolution. We'll put it up on the screen. Two more, right? I think we have two more. Okay, so we'll just uh, wait for the team to put it up on the screen. So it's resolution number 2327, titled Research on Indian Residential Schools. Uh, it reads, uh, therefore, be it resolved 
that the NAN Chiefs and Assembly mandate the NAN Executive Council through the Reclamation and Healing Department support the IRS research to support NAN community members and associated, associated initiatives and to develop educational resources. Further be it resolved that Chiefs and Assembly mandate continued advocacy by NAN for access to records and data sovereignty. Further be it resolved that Chiefs and Assembly mandate that NAN through the Reclamation and Healing Department to assist in research upon request to support communities, survivors and their families in support of the search for missing children and unmarked graves at former IRS sites. Finally, be it resolved that the implementation of this resolution shall be without prejudice to existing and future projects, initiatives, processes or other proposals at the First Nation and Tribal Council levels and in addition the resolution shall not interfere with individual First Nation communities access to funding. Uh, resolution dated at Thunder Bay this uh, 17th day of August 2023. Uh, we did have a mover. Uh, it looks like mover's not here so I'm going to ask for a mover. The seconder is proxy Gary Owen who is in the room. So can I have a mover for the resolution? Uh, looking for a mover to the resolution. Do I have a mover? Are we in we wakaunan? Then we can discuss and debate. Nobody wants to give me eye contact either. <laughs> it's kind of like the teacher up looking at the. Do I have a mover? We will require a mover to uh, discuss, debate, and vote on the resolution. Miigwech, Ganogamink, First Nation. Proxy for Sherry Taylor, Ganogamink, I move it. Thank you, Miigwech. Uh, proxy for Genugamink. Thank you. So, with that uh, mover, do you have? Do you want to speak to the resolution? You don't. It's not required, but if you wish to speak, no, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, seconder, a proxy, Gary Owen. We can do that, Gowen. Okay. Any comments, questions, discussion on the resolution? Any comments? Uh, nothing online. Nothing online. Last call. Any comments? I see none. So with that, I'm going to call question. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand, please. Thank you. Uh, any opposition? Uh, no opposition. Any abstentions? Oh, I better check online here. Nothing online. Okay, resolution carried. Thank you. Miigwech. Last one, one more. How's it going? And I'll just wait for the team. There we go. Uh, so it's resolution 2328. It's titled Support for uh, Wekwadong Lodge Expansion Project. Just for pronunciation, I've, I've always heard it pronounced Wekwadong. And uh, I was told that the uh, Anishinaabeg in this area, that's pronounced Wihkwedeng. Wihkwedeng, that's the name for Thunder Bay, Wihkwedeng. Uh, it reads, Therefore be resolved that Anishinaabeaski Nation Chiefs and Assembly support the expansion project for Wihkwedeng Lodge so it can continue to provide supports for community members and increase cost-efficient capacity. Finally, be it resolved that the NAN Chiefs and Assembly call on NAN Executive Council to advocate for equitable funding from all levels of government and in particular engage with the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada to resume funding discussions initiated more than one year ago to support the expansion project. I saw something happening. Was there a change in wording? Or was that just formatting? Just formatting? Okay, so it's, it's good. Uh, dated at Thunder Bay the 17th day of August 2023, moved by Chief Dorothy Toledo, Airland First Nation, who is present, seconded by proxy Martha Taylor, Ganugaming First Nation, who is also present. Uh, Chief Toledo, do you want to speak to the resolution? 
Okay, yes, yeah, I'll say a few things on it. Uh, okay, uh, well, thank you for that, uh, the, how to say it, we, we, we could on, we could on. We quitting. We quitting. Yeah. We, I've always heard people say we, we could That's on. That's how I've time. always heard it too, yeah. yeah. So thank, thank you for that. Uh, okay, uh, um, I know there was a previous uh, a resolution already similar. You know, this is uh, this resolution is about uh, when our uh, you know when our members come out for medical and all that. It's uh, very frustrating, you know, when all these cancellations. Sometimes, sometimes we have our uh, our 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 people sitting in the lobbies. You know, your room. You have no more room. You have to be out of here by eleven o'clock. You know, we we all have those. Uh, issues with our people and it's very frustrating when they call you know the health director or the or the leadership saying oh we're stranded here you know how come this is happening and all that you know it's just a just the way the system is the health system you know it has to be better like we can't keep going going that way you know we have to uh, advocate for a better uh, uh, system for our, uh, for our membership for for our members that come out <coughs> for medical reasons, and I fully support this uh, this expansion. You know, uh, we really need this. It's a must, and uh, you know, it can help in accommodating our people at times when uh, there's no rooms available, and uh, you know, when it is. Uh, Nishinaabe uh, place of uh, lodging, and uh, I, I, that's why I'm uh, moving this uh, resolution. Thank you. Miigwech, uh, Chief. Uh, Proxy uh, Taylor, do you want to speak to the resolution? No comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, floor is open. Uh, Chief Kamino Uh Good afternoon. Hi. Okay. Um, Pasca and know the man first time I heard uh, I usually always hear Wikidong we could don't connect with now isn't correct anyways um, uh, I guess uh, this uh, lodge is uh, private and uh, we have uh, as, as a chiefs in assembly we don't really have you know uh, a say in their business so they're being a private entity so uh, with their expansion, my, my recommendation would be to report to the chiefs on the progress of their expansion plans. And also, um, and if the communities of First Nations wish to pursue, you know, the, uh, you know, the lodges for their own people, like, uh, like for example, Burskin Lake, uh, I always have, like always hear my people saying, that they have problems coming out to the to, to the to uh, urban centers accommodation wise, so uh, they always come, you know, to the chief, to the leader, with their problems. So, uh, my, and uh, so I think it would be best if, uh, uh, for example, if I wish to pursue uh, another avenue, you know, for my people. Uh, as a lot for a lodge to lodge them, you know, uh, I would uh, without the prejudice, you know, they should be to provide my plan. Thank you. Okay, miigwech, uh, So the other suggestion, the one we have on the um, uh, on the screen, the other suggestion is uh, that this support is uh, without prejudice to any other initiatives that uh, First Nations may wish to. Uh, enter into or look at to provide services for their community members. So I'll, uh, I'll look to the team to come up with a draft wording. We were having a discussion with, while they're doing that, our co-chairs, uh, the rules of procedure actually say, uh, as co-chairs, we cannot be the ones to uh, put in or suggest wording uh, in the uh, resolutions. But sometimes it's important that we just uh, re, 
restate or uh, phrase uh, what has been said so that the resolution team can get it. Okay, there it is. Uh, so there's two uh, additions. Uh, Chief, uh, so it reads, Further be it resolved that the implementation of this resolution shall be without prejudice to similar existing and future projects at the First Nation and Tribal Council levels. Finally, be it resolved that NAN shall report on progress at the ex on the expansion project at future Chiefs' Assemblies. Anyway, um, guys, good day. I'll provide uh, updates. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the feedback is it should be the, the Wekwadong Lodge to provide the uh, progress reports. Okay, so it reads, finally be resolved that Wekwadong Lodge shall report on progress on the expansion project of future chiefs' assemblies. Okay. Uh, mover, are you okay with that? Okay, seconder? Seconder is okay with it. Okay, very good. Uh, floor is open. Uh, Roxy, Matthew, Angie's. Yeah, I think that the first clause kind of covers my, uh, my concern again because I know there's, there's been discussions from the two tribal councils doing the similar thing for, for their communities, so I'm okay with that thing. Okay, so you're good with the change as well. That'll cover your uh, your issue. Miigwech. Did I see another hand go up? No, I guess not. Final call. Any uh, comments on uh, the resolution? Yeah, Chief uh, Benson. I uh, I support the change because at this time there's really nothing. Uh, we can really do if we have problems, like we, like you said, it's a private private entity. So, so with this change, I hope uh, I hope it goes through. Thank you. Okay, miigwech. Thank you. So, with uh, without any other additional comments, I'm going to go ahead and call question. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand, please. Thank you. Any opposition? Nothing online as well, no opposition, any abstentions? I see none, none online, uh, resolution is carried. So thank you, yeah. I think that's all the resolutions. Yes, very good. Good job. Uh, we had a few minutes left to go, uh, so with that, uh, on the agenda, we also had the Chief's Open Forum. Now, there's been opportunity to speak to certain issues throughout the Assembly. I know it's been a long day, a long three days. We went through lunch uh, to get business done, really important discussions. So, unless you have something you'd like to raise, I'd like to uh, uh, proceed with wrapping up uh, the Assembly. If you do have an issue, uh, let me know now. Otherwise, uh, we will start to wrap up. Oh, no, that's the elder answering his phone. <laughs> okay, miigwech. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Connie to start wrapping up. Uh, it's good, good to see uh, all the good discussion. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to help out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for the last three days. It's good to listen to you all. And um, at this time, I'd like to call upon the Grand Chief for closing comments. Nice speech, there, Adam. Thank you, 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 Adam. Thank I just want to acknowledge uh, all of you, the leadership chiefs, delegates, uh, to thank you for you being here and also those online uh, that were able to participate uh, through a video. Thank you for 
your support uh, and direction on the important issues that we uh, presented to you uh, this week. It's very important that, uh, that we do this, that uh, NAN, the executive, um, and the work that we do, it comes from you. Uh, the direction and the mandate comes from you through resolutions that you just passed. So miigwech for that. Yesterday I, I talked about uh, sort of and also in recognition of the uh, the 50th anniversary of the, the creation of this organization and why it was created. Um, I think that's something that all of us need to reflect on and I also want to um, ask my colleagues on an executive to think about why we're here and why we do this work. Um, and we talked about many things this week and we are committed to working with you, your, your tribal councils and addressing the many issues that you deal with every day. But there's also bigger issues that NAN as a treaty organization needs to be aware of. And there are some real threats that we see coming to our territory. If you look at the east, you know, there's still an outstanding claim from the Quebec Crees that they want to lay claim to a good chunk of our a good chunk of the Tree Nine territory on the east side. And then to the south you have the Metis encroachment that they that they've suddenly found communities, historic communities in Treaty Nine territory that they want to lay claim to our lands and our territory. And to the west you have the the nuclear waste dump, you know, that we talked about today. And the threat, if we don't do it right, that the threat that it poses to our lands and to our waters and our rivers. And then to the north you have the ongoing pressures on our communities to open up the mining activity, whether it's in the Ring of Fire area or the lithium mines that are being proposed in the northwest part of, of the Nan Territory. And these threats are real, and we need to acknowledge them for what they are, for what they represent. And our job as Nishnai Basque Nation is to help you, to support you in the work that you need to do to defending, you know, uh, as Proxy Wayne Munias always tells us, you know, asserting our, our rights, asserting our authority, and showing Ontario and Canada and industry that, that we are the ones that are actually in charge of what happens in our territories. And that's our role. I just want to um, acknowledge the NAN executive and thank them for the work that they do. And also the NAN staff. Uh, I know it's, uh, I sort of alluded to this yesterday that I recognize that it's been a very challenging time the last couple of years and that we're committed to ensuring as we move forward with this work that you are able to do your work in a safe space, that you should feel safe all the time, uh, wherever you are, for you to do your work and do it well and to ensure that you have the resources that you need to be able to do your work. And that's something that we are committed to doing, to looking at the reports, the investiga investigation that have been done, and to ensure that the recommendations from those investigations are fully implemented. That's our commitment to, to our staff. I also just want to assure you, leadership chiefs, that the important issues that you raised with us this week, that we actually follow up on, on these issues. And that I'll be writing a letter to you next week to outline some of the steps, how that will happen. One of the things that we want to, and I'll, I'll be meeting with the Danan executive early next week, is we want to plan uh, whether it's a two-day fall summit or a fall chief's assembly where we need to come back and reconvene and, and update you on the issues that you raised here this week. And I know fall is a busy time. There's already 
other events happening, other meetings being planned, including moose hunting. I, I'm, I plan to take some time off as well. Um, and I know you have your tribal council gatherings as well and community events, and we're committed to going to those events. But at, at the same time, we'll be, we'll be planning um, in the fall time to to have a fall chiefs assembly where we can come back and finish uh, the business that uh, somebody was sending business from this meeting. So I just want to wish you all uh, safe travels and uh, thank everyone. I just want to acknowledge um, our elders council. There's some new faces at the elders council table. You know, you hear this too in your communities and I hear it too that we don't have any more elders in our communities, that we're losing our elders. But that's not really true. We have elders that are coming up and that they will take on that important role of making sure that our communities are looked after. And I feel good about that when I see people like, like Lucy, that they're stepping up and that we don't have to have this feeling that we don't have any elders, we do. So I just want to acknowledge them. Uh, the Women's Council, uh, thank you for your support and guidance and keeping us in line, holding us accountable. I'm looking at Brenda when I say this. <clears throat> uh, and to the Youth Council, uh, some of them are leaving us. And uh, I cannot express my thank you, my gratitude enough to uh, Janine and and uh, Lyndon and uh, and others that are leaving. Jericho, Jericho is leaving us. Uh, who else is leaving us? Ashley. Ashley is. I think started when she was twelve. And just the, the tremendous leadership that they've shown and the growth. We've seen them grow uh, to become real leaders. And I know that they'll make a difference in whatever it is that they do next. So thank you so much for your service. Um, and to the co-chairs, uh, Kyra, Adam, and Connie, let's give them a hand. Amiwa, epak sarimian, cuy minun wabai gua mina, gua jam agenak, kerja 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 been informed the process that we're going to be doing with the closing is having the staff give the flags to the chiefs and then we're going to go into closing prayer and then when the drum is done the Zagatishmok they'll dance their, their flags out Mia? Yeah? okay all right so if we can have the staff okay Roxy Owen uh, I'm just want to say uh, we just lost our uh, a young a young man in in my reserve yes, yesterday. So just remember your prayers. Miigwech. Miigwech. So, um, Terry. Okay, so if we can have the staff give the flags to the chiefs. Shema go. That's what my aunt used to say when she'd send us home. Shema go. Get home right away, yeah, when we're in trouble. So if, I guess you'll have to carry some of the flags because some of the staff had to carry flags then, right? So some will have to be carried by staff, the flags. Yep. So if staff, if you can give the flags to the chiefs. I knew I was in trouble when I heard that, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
No, it was um, it was um, that southern Bertha. Bertha. Bertha oh, she's gone. She's gone. Okay, sure. So we have to find out. Merle. Merle's an officer. Merle. He's gonna, who's gonna carry mesh flag? Carry mesh flag. So, if chiefs, if you can come and grab your flags. Get Lucy to Lucy. Lucy to uh, carry a flag. The veterans flag. Okay, so everybody has a flag now. Um, now I'm going to call upon Elder Terry Fiddler to cl close our meeting with a prayer.
Mia Migot, can a knock come in now? Uegagish to ek, me not, mamob, mamob. Mitis, uh, Kesagawit mug, manito. Sago to go gagon, penema, a week at the end, to bar much to one. Migi Makamigo one, Barney. Gay we jam up on the match to be a week to go with towards Gaywin. And you saw Nokiang, Barney, Nanda guys, Nanda guy, no no goang, Chibak in a mang, Mamo Benon, Ego Gay, Chigaba mang, Mitaskagin, a witch, Ekbak in a makin and Ganesiak, Mitaskajiba mak, Ganesiak, Missas him come go on. But that's okay. Uh, uh, carrying a flag is a, an honor. And Miwegeje, uh, and now come and get money to a bigger, a bigger no enemy work or Minagokama Sogijagagi with a bumitiak. Mouts may stay. Gago negate doesn't that may go to Makanak. Ego go to Gabitamage watch. Ogamakan and Ganapsko watch. Mouts may stay. Gago, Mam Nanjagan, a community work nongum. Awegagi. Kagi kiwe o tap nangit kini gani manan mars mste nan chena nakom nanong we kagi kagi tota mak nongom this week we ge o ge kamte ge watch mars mste ekmini ge ek be mad son enenda man mitasis kaisa ka kwech magmaneto chena 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 Miguet Manito, Sonia Camigo, the go tick no dem. Mikinak de Jean, Bejago Mite. Can a knock come and no go more than a gish to hang. March mistake has come. Miguel the moon and a gishkamang. March mistake and a mezon and a gishkamang no gum gagishkak. Owe, cabit touch matagoang. Canaganiguang do dem in anag. Owe Bejic, Ogamakan, Poplar Hill. Eka gwe dead, the mount nendement wae nongom gae kanak skang gawin. Eko gae oe Catholic ug makan gawin gawo ni arts kasag yar to to dema. Mitas ko gae gino ang kinesh na ko siak nongom. Eka gae the mangit manito oe the sit na gae nongom oe ganang skang gae nmezon. Skaw siin eh the mino gae oe the gae ni gan kaya nti na biak. Mitä se joka kuvaa minun gemani to, ogoe, ogoe osko gumakan, se joen, se joen daagusit, ogoe teniikan gewin tiinabet, ogoe geogum, ogumakan enter, kauita mungot, koe kuvit no kimi toat se joka sentaman, ogoe teniikan, kena geegon, nongum kata sen joka teni, kuvit no kimi toat se ogoe, he ogoe ogoe, kauita kuvaa minun Kino ko makaneg tayo ay nandag usawat, wai tega wiki wai wat. Ega kaya ko nito na si damseg o tibe o tibe masayon nawa. Ko ay kaya taksh nawa, kaya benjigyon nawa. O ko ay kaya benonti sag nosa nanag ni chans nanag gobetag nanag kana wai nta mawshinam. Ego kaya ko ay ngkichan nanag ega kaya kasikto wat ay skam tayo basugui wat, wiche. Wege gaya kuswat akusyoga megong kinsen na nando at da kin kinagegon ne kasikta mo siya. Wege uskad sag maotya na tuat wae matagegon gawin na kamen si min guat kad kad de ben maguat wae tewasya si min at da gawin na bejo bejo agsa bagan ne gawin na si Jemino nas kawat, ega gegon si Ben Maguat. Mio ay sa gawit si Nan Ongom. Kakina sa ay nmis na mo ay kanigis tuang kagita ng damo ng jemino siang. Ego kagita o tagusun. Mio ay mi guat si Nan Ongom ka kaunaksak. Mi guat, mi guat.
Ne